Good evening. Um, if you'd like to come on down, um, just sit up front here and uh, I'll begin momentarily. Um, just sit anywhere you like. Uh, the further up you sit, the easier it is to look around and um, be able to take everything in. Uh huh. Good evening. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoying our festival so far. My name is Nick Kostopoulos, and on behalf of His Eminence Metropolitan Alexios of Atlanta, Father Paul Kaplanis, Father Christos Mars, and all the faithful, I'd like to welcome you to the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral. And uh, it's my great joy to hopefully be able to answer a few questions that you have about Orthodox Christianity, and then we'll take a quick tour around the icons here in the cathedral. But before we get too far into the church part of the tour, let's talk a little bit about how we got here. Greek immigrants started arriving to Atlanta in the 1890s, and they brought with them the things you see outside, the culture, the music, the art, the dancing, the food, and that sense of family and community. But they also brought with them their religion, their faith, which you can see so beautifully manifested here in this cathedral. Our parish was founded in 1905 in a building in downtown Atlanta on Garnett Street. It was later moved to Pryor Street, and then in 1965, they broke ground here on Claremont Road, and the church was consecrated in 1970. So Greek Orthodoxy, what exactly does that mean? Well, obviously, the first thing you hear is Greek, uh, but since you were kind enough to join us and have had a few seconds to look around, you've probably noticed that is not Zeus. When we use the word Greek, we're simply referring to the language that was being used at the time the church was founded. Uh, when we think about when the Gospels were written during the time of Christ, um, Greek was the common language in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And it had been that way even before the time of the Roman Empire, if we go back to Alexander the Great uh, in the fourth century BCE. It was the common language for people who lived in that part of the empire. So when you hear Greek Orthodox, just think Eastern part of the Roman Empire. You might also hear Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Antiochian, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian. It's all the same thing. It's all one church. There are over 300 million members of the Orthodox Church, and it's the second largest Christian confession in the world. Now, from a purely historical perspective, the Orthodox Church was founded in the year 33 AD by the apostles themselves on the day of Pentecost, which you can see in that icon just over your right shoulder, the large panel, the third panel from the back. Uh, but we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to the icon portion of the tour. Now, when we say that the church was founded by the apostles, we mean that literally. This church is located within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, which itself is led by the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, what we would now refer to as modern-day Istanbul, Turkey. Now, the current ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew can trace his lineage back from the bishop that ordained him to the bishop that ordained him all the way back to the apostle Andrew, the brother of Peter, the first called. Andrew was the bishop of what was then known as Byzantium, later Constantinople, 38 years, or 30, 38 CE. So when you read in the book of Acts in the Bible, you're reading about the Orthodox Church. For example, Acts 9-11 mentions a church in a street called Straight. 
thankfully, despite the war in Syria, that church still stands, and it's always been a Greek Orthodox church. When you read Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, Corinthians, Philippians, he's writing to churches that he established that still exist as Greek Orthodox churches. Now, why all these historical details? All these historical details because Orthodoxy's understanding is that Christianity is given to you. We have to be able to receive it. We can't just make it up. Christ handed the church to his apostles. They handed it to their followers, and then they handed it all the way up here to us in the 21st century. It's a gift, and a gift should be treasured so that when it's handed on to the next generation and the next person, it isn't changed. The feeling that you get of timelessness and of antiquity and the something being ancient is an expression of the church's desire, hope, and prayer to hand on that which it's received. Uh, when we think of tradition, tradition is a Latin word. It means to hand on. You know, we can think of tradition as if it's a thing uh, to be said alongside scripture, but tradition is an action. It's the act of handing something on. Now, Another way that the church has of handing on experience of God is through the scriptures. Uh, during the first 400 years of the church's history, the Orthodox Church compiled the scriptures that all, the Christ all Christians know today as the Bible. Now, the scriptures are central to everything that we do here in the church, and yet the Bible for us is not in itself the faith. It's a, it's a tool that the church uses to teach the faith. To put it another way, we have a book based around the faith rather than the other way around. Now, a basic summation of what we believe as Orthodox Christians can be found in the Nicene Creed. And we're not the only church to use some version of the Nicene Creed, but for those who may not know, it was written in the year 325 at the First Ecumenical Council in Nicaea. This council was called by the Emperor Constantine to address a heresy by a priest named Arius from Alexandria and some of Arius' followers who denied that Christ was actually divine. Uh, an interesting footnote, uh, St. Nicholas, yes, that jolly old St. Nicholas, slapped Arius in the face so hard that he was outraged by his heresy. Um, he was briefly put into prison, and there's an interesting end of the story of how he got out. St. Anthony the Great, who founded the concept of monasticism, was 75 years old at the time living in Egypt, heard that the heretic Arius was going to be present, got up out of his cave at the age of 75, went all the way to Turkey, just to tell Arius in front of the assembled crowd that he was wrong, then went back into his cave in Egypt and lived another 35 years. So if you're getting slapped by St. Nicholas and lectured by the father of monasticism, it probably tells you that you need to rethink a few things. us, but I do think it would be helpful if you knew a few things before you came. Um, the first is simply knowing the reason why we're here. We come here to pray, to glorify God, and to commune with God through prayer and through the sacraments. Um, those of you who might be coming from Protestant confessions will notice during the course of the service that the focus is not on the sermon. You can see there that even our pulpit is a little bit off to the side. Uh, don't get me wrong, we love a good sermon. Uh, the liturgy that we celebrate was named after St. John Chrysostom. Uh, Chrysostom means golden mouthed. That's how eloquent his sermons were, that they gave him that nickname. Um, so we love a good sermon, but it's not the reason that we celebrate our services specifically. Um, you'll also know that we stand during prayer. Uh, in fact, in many Orthodox churches around the world, uh, there are no pews, usually, um, except for the elderly and the infirm. People are standing almost all the time. And the idea is that we're not here as an audience or as participants like we would be if we were in a lecture as we are now. Uh, we're standing because we're working with the prayers of the angelic hosts, and together, through that work, the room that we're in becomes heaven, the throne room of God. Now, when I say that we have a liturgy, what does that mean? Um, a liturgy is simply a set of set offerings and prayers that are prayed or sung um, and chanted week after week. The word liturgy literally means the work of the people. And 
I could understand that for those who might not have a liturgy per se, it might get a little repetitive. Doesn't that get boring doing the same thing week after week? But the idea is that it's not boredom because when you repeat something enough, there begins to be a set rhythm. You know what's coming, you concentrate more, you're more focused, and through that rhythm, the mind is calmed and the thoughts are stilled. Remember, it says in the scriptures, be still and know that I am God. The Greek word for it is isihia, and there's an inner stillness, an inner quiet that we seek in prayer, especially in private prayer. Now, it's obviously different if you're here in the church when we're praying together, that's work, that's to be prayed aloud. However, we remember the words of St. Isaac the Syrian who says, if you love truth, be a lover of silence. Now, what other lesson can the fathers of the church pass down to us all the way in the 21st century? Because in our busy lives today, when are we ever just still? And when are we ever just silent? You will notice if you attend a service here at the cathedral that some of the service will be said in Greek and we'll have books for everyone to follow along so that no one misses a single word. If you were in a Russian Orthodox church, you might hear some Russian. If in Antiochian church, you would hear some Arabic, same in Romanian, Bulgarian, Serbian. So what's amazing is that no matter the language or the accent, that Sunday we will all be saying the same prayers, the same liturgy. We'll read the same scriptural passage and even the same sermon will be likely on the same topic. So when you're standing, whether you're standing in Moscow or Jerusalem, Damascus, Athens, Greece, or Atlanta, Georgia, it is still one church. I also think you'll find that whatever's going on here in the heart during prayer can be equally as important as to what's going on up there in the altar. In fact, in an Orthodox service, the priests have their back to us 90% of the time, just to remind us that we're all praying together and that they're leading us in common worship. There's a story that illustrates this beautifully in the conversion of the Slavic lands. Uh, Prince Vladimir of Kiev and all of the Rus, he wanted a religion for his royal court and to bind the people together. So he sent emissaries all around the world and said, go find out the world's best religions, examine them and come back to me and we'll pick the best one, one that would be the most suitable. Now, one group went to Constantinople to Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, where you can still go today. And in their letter to Vladimir, they said, when we stood in the temple, we hardly knew whether we were in heaven or on earth, for in truth, it seems impossible to behold such glory and such magnificence on earth. What we could not possibly relate to you what we saw in that place, but one thing we know is that in that place, God dwells among men. But what's fascinating, and the reason I share that story with you, is how it relates to what goes on in our hearts. When you think about it, these Slavic emissaries wouldn't have understood a word of what was being said to them. They didn't speak Greek. They wouldn't have had any idea what was going on, and yet they wrote, the one thing we know is that in that place, God dwells among men. Saint Diadokos of Fotiki, who was a great theologian in the fifth century, said, true theology isn't information about God, it's an experience of God. And that's what those men felt in that church, and that's what I feel when I stand here and pray each week. It's an experience of God. Now, a few last things to note before we move on to the icons. We are a Trinitarian church. We believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Orthodoxy believes that the Christian faith and the church are inseparable. We share fully in the life of the Holy Trinity through the church. We receive the sacraments and we Orthodox believe Holy Communion to be the true literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. Hopefully I've answered a few of your questions about Orthodox Christianity. Forgive me if I failed to do it justice. If you could take away just a few things, I would hope that they'd be that the church is ancient, but also timeless. It's full of wisdom, yet it is humble, reverence and quiet. Now, I like to keep this in mind anytime I'm giving these talks. Um, there was a British bishop in our church who passed away just a few weeks ago, actually, born into the Anglican faith and converted to Orthodoxy, uh, Metropolitan Callistos Ware, born Timothy Ware. And he taught for years as an Orthodox bishop at Oxford University in England. 
and his theology students were always peppering him with questions about God, and he would remind them that it is not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question, but rather to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God, he said, is not so much the object of our knowledge as he is the cause of our wonder. Mystery and wonder are two words that the Orthodox Church is certainly comfortable with. So with that understanding, let's take that sense of mystery and wonder and apply it to the icons that surround us. Icons are the first thing that you'll notice when you enter an Orthodox Church, and they are, as the Slavic envoy said to Prince Vladimir, beautiful. But what they didn't know, perhaps, was that for an Orthodox Christian, icons are not an aesthetic object. They are not meant to be art. Art is to be viewed. Icons are to be experienced. Just like scripture is a tool that church gives us, or tradition, icons are tools that are meant to inspire us to prayer and silent contemplation. If you notice, in every single one of these icons, they express the inexpressible. They're silent. They're not speaking. And through their silence, they show us that the veil between this world and the next one is thin, and that God and the angels are ever present. When you see us enter, you'll see us cross ourselves and kiss the icon. Now, there's a simple reason for this. It is not a form of idolatry. We cross ourselves so that bodily and physically we acknowledge our belief in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that it's not a mental exercise. Christianity involves the whole body, and there is a certain physicality about our worship. We kiss the icons because we have a relationship with Christ, his mother, and the saints just as we might kiss the photo of a departed relative or a relative that we love. Now, most icons that you'd find in the average Orthodox Church would be painted on canvas or wood. Now, we have a rare blessing in that all our icons are mosaic. They were done by Mr. Sirio Tonelli, who was not Orthodox when he began the project, but became Orthodox by the time he finished. He began with the six large panels, which are 22 feet high and 10 and a half feet wide. Then this back wall behind me, called the Platitera Tonuranon, which means wider than the heavens, and the dome. All these were completed in 1969. The icon in the narthex was completed in 1978, and the icons across the back and on the front of the choir loft were done later as separate projects. I'll now describe to you what's depicted in each icon if you were entering through the church. When you walk back there through the front doors, the first thing you'd see is the large icon of Christ giving the Sermon on the Mount. To your left would be an icon, is an icon of the Resurrection, and by the candle stand, there's an icon of the Virgin Mary, or the Theotokos. That's an honorific that we give to the Virgin Mary, that it means she who bore God. As you proceed toward the lit candles and the doors of the nave there, you'd probably notice the two large icons on the wall. One is of an old man with a long beard. That's Petros of Argos. He was a bishop and wonder worker in Peloponnesus, an area in Greece, in a city known as Argos. And since we have a large number of families that are from that part of Greece, these very important to us. Across from him is St. Catherine. She was a child martyr. And now we've mounted both their stories and placed each of their icons, so if you have a few minutes, you can read them in more detail. They're pretty fascinating. Now we'll start here in the sanctuary, the nave. We'll start right there in the back corner with the icon of the nativity. Now you'll notice this is in a bit of an amalgamation because it depicts Christ as an infant in the manger, but also as a young child being bathed. So it denotes a passage of time. You'll notice in the lower corner in the green, Joseph. Now, Joseph doesn't look like he's having a particularly good day, and the reason for this is that in most versions of the icon, Mr. Tonelli left a part out. Uh, in most versions of the icon, Joseph is talking with an old man. That old man is really a depiction of the devil who's whispering doubts that the child is not really divine. That I, that detail in the icon is an important re rebuke to the Arian heresy that also said very much the same thing. The next icon, the first of the large panels, is the baptism of Christ. It's also referred to as the theophany or epiphany, which means a revelation of God. The reason for that name is that the participants event of this event 
heard the voice of God the Father say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You can see that visual depiction of that voice through the beam of light. They saw Christ in the flesh in the Jordan River and they saw the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all together, one revelation of God, theophany. Uh, you'll notice two creatures at the bottom of the icon, and they represent the rivers and the seas, and all of this reflects what was written in Psalm 114, verse three. The sea saw and fled, the river turned back. The next panel is an icon of the Transfiguration. Christ transfigured in light on Mount Tabor. Uh, you'll see Christ surrounded by what's called a mandorla, which represents the uncreated light. To Christ's left is the prophet Elijah, or Elias, and to his right is Moses. Moses is the one holding the book of the law, not with the long white beard. That's something I was surprised to learn, thanks to, no thanks to Charlton Heston. Um, Below them are Peter, John, and James who came to the mountain and saw Christ in his glory as far as they were able. You can see them shielding their eyes. The next large panel is the icon of the crucifixion. Christ on the cross and below him the three Marys. Mary his mother, Mary the mother of James and Salome, and Mary Magdalene. To their right are Saint John the Evangelist, theologian, and Saint Joseph of Arimathea. Now, an important thing to note about Orthodox iconography as concerns the crucifixion is that you very rarely see the crown of thorns. And icon Orthodox iconography, the spiritual reality is more important than the physical reality. The emphasis is not so much on the passion of Christ so much as his sacrifice. This depicts the moment just after he has uttered the words, it is finished. Moving across the nave, to the next of the large panels, of course, is three days later, the icon of the resurrection, or anastasis, Christ trampling on the doors of Hades. You can see death, or Satan, in chains, and Christ is lifting Adam and Eve out of their tombs. You can see that Eve's hand is covered, the hand that plucked the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and surrounding them are the kings and prophets of the Old Testament. You often have King David and King Solomon, and always St. John the Baptist in this icon. Next is Christ's ascension into heaven, 40 days after Easter. We can see Christ and his mother, always depicted as being very calm, and the questioning looks of the disciples and apostles wondering what happens now. Now, those questions are answered 10 days later on Pentecost, the final of the six large panels. Pentecost means 50 days, 50 days after Easter. And depicted are the 11 disciples that Christ chose and Matthias, the disciple who is elected in Acts chapter two to replace Judas Iscariot who betrayed Christ. The event in the icon depicted is the Holy Spirit descending upon them as tongues of fire and you'll notice there's a gap at the top of the icon. Uh, that seat is for Christ as the head of our church who is invisibly present. Moving on to the last half dome there is the Dormition or falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. Now, this icon is interesting because this is the only icon that depicts something that does not come from canonized scripture. It comes from holy tradition stories that were not included in scripture but passed down as reverent and true. And it concerns the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. There the Virgin Mary is on her deathbed and we see Christ holding what looks like an infant, which we take to be the depiction of Christ taking her soul, the soul of his mother, now that she has fallen asleep in the Lord. There's a nice bit of symmetry when we consider that in that icon, she is holding Christ or near Christ in swaddling clothes in the icon of the nativity. And now he holds her just as she once held him. You'll also see that only 11 of the disciples are depicted. Uh, poor Thomas was always late, although there's an interesting end to that story as well. Um, across the choir loft, 
is an icon that was completed later, so it's out of sequence in the story, but of course it's Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, uh, the events that occurred on Palm Sunday, a week before Easter. Now, now if I could just have your attention back this way, there's an icon on the pulpit. Um, the icons represent the four gospel writers. Matthew is the angel, Mark is the lion, Luke the ox, and John is represented by this eagle. On the raised platform here behind me, the solea is the double-headed eagle, the symbol of New Rome or the Byzantine Empire, and it symbolized the harmony that existed between church and state. Over there is the bishop's throne, and the icon is of Christ as the high priest. That brings us to the wall of icons behind me called the iconostasis. If you'll just give me one moment. Now, the iconostasis is an interesting and distinguishing feature of an Orthodox church, uh, and it's something that developed over time. In the earliest Orthodox churches, there was a curtain between the nave and the altar, similar to the Holy of Holies in the ancient Jewish temple. Um, and eventually, it developed that they took the curtain down but put columns up. And then they figured, well, if we're going to have columns, we might as well decorate them with icons. And it developed into what we see here. Now, an iconostasium always follows the same pattern and same basic rules. In front of you, we have the royal doors. To the left of the royal doors, there is always an icon of Mary holding the Christ child. You can see her pointing in the direction of the Christ child. And the reason for this is that the icon there represents the incarnation of Christ, and the other icon represents Christ in his second glorious coming. So everything that happens between the royal doors occurs after the incarnation of Christ and before his second coming. To the right of Christ, there's always an icon of John the Baptist. To the left of the Virgin Mary holding the Christ child, there's always an icon for the name of the church. And since we're the Annunciation Cathedral, that's an icon of the Annunciation when the Archangel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would bear the Christ child. To the right of John the Baptist's door is the door through which you would enter the altar. That's of the Archangel Gabriel. And on the left, you have the door through which we exit the altar, which is always of Archangel Michael. The back wall, as I referenced earlier, is called the Platitera. The full name is the Platitera Tonura Non, meaning more spacious than the heavens. And you'll always see an icon of the Virgin Mary. The reason for that is, just as the ceiling connects the floor to the wall, we know that Christ came down from heaven, taking flesh from Mary's womb, and so she connected heaven to earth. You will always find an icon of the Virgin Mary in this place in the Orthodox Church. Finally, that brings us to the dome. This icon of Christ is called the Pandokrator, meaning the rule of all. On each side, you'll see the Greek letter, Isus, I-C-X-E, Greek for Isus Christos. And within Christ's halo, you see the letters Oon, Omega Omicron Nu, which literally means he who is, in reference, of course, to God's answer to Moses' question, I am who I am. The dome has a total of three and a half million tiles, and the dome signifies Christ bending the heavens to earth to hear our prayers. That completes our tour. We have handouts about the tour in the narthex, or if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, our preschool and kindergarten through eighth grade parochial school, the Annunciation Day School, will be giving tours tomorrow and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, there's a kid's tent where you'll feel free to sign up, and a school representative will be there to give you a personal tour if you're interested in our school. Uh, thank you for coming, and enjoy the rest of the festival.
Ευλογητός ο Θεός ημών, πάντοτε νυν και αή, και εις τους αιώνας.
Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, the next tour will begin at 6.30, so until then, feel free to walk around. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them.
Thank you. Tour will start in about five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to come in and sit closer down front, it'll be um, nicer for your neck to look around. So feel free to come on close down front. Tour will start in just about one minute. If you'd like to come on down up front and have a seat, I'll only take about 25 minutes to half an hour, and then you'll feel free to look around uh, here in the narthex. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I have to say, um, having done this a lot, this is the most I've ever seen on a Friday night at 6.30, so thanks very much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's enjoying the festival so far. 
My name is Nick Kostopoulos, and on behalf of His Eminence, Metropolitan Alexios of Atlanta, Father Paul Kaplanis, and Father Christos Mars, and all the faithful, I'd like to welcome you to the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral. Uh, great joy today to be able to answer a few of your questions about what the Orthodox Christianity is, and then we'll take a quick tour around the icons that surround us here in the arriving and settling in Atlanta, Georgia in the late 1890s. And they brought with them their culture, music, art, dancing, the food, and that sense of family and community that you'll be able to get here at the Greek festival. But they also brought with them their religion and their faith, which you can see beautifully manifested here in the cathedral. Uh, our parish was originally founded in 1905 in a building in downtown Atlanta on Garnett Street. It was later moved to Pryor Street and then in 1965, ground was broken here on Claremont Road, and this building was consecrated in 1970. So Greek Orthodoxy, what does that mean? Well, obviously, the first thing you hear is Greek, uh, but since you were kind enough to join us and have had a few moments to look around, you've probably figured out that that is not Zeus. Um, <laughs> Greek is just a reference to the language, the language that was used at the time in the Hellenic culture of the eastern part of the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. And if you think about it, it was even before the Roman Empire, thanks to Alexander the Great in the fourth century. That's why the Gospels were originally all written in Greek. It was the common language of the people who lived in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So when you hear Greek Orthodox, it's easier to think of the eastern part of the Roman Empire. You might hear Eastern Orthodox used generally, uh, you might hear Russian Orthodox, Antiochian, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian. It's all one church. And there are over 300 million members of the Orthodox Church worldwide. It's actually the second largest Christian confession in the world. Now, from a purely historical perspective, the Orthodox Christian Church was founded in the year 33 AD by the apostles themselves on the day of Pentecost, which you can see in the icon just over your right shoulder, uh, the third large panel on the back there. Uh, we'll get to the details of what that icon means later on during that portion of the tour. Um, but when we say the church was founded by the apostles, we mean that literally. This church within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America is led by the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, uh, which we would refer to in modern day as Istanbul, Turkey. Now the current ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew, can trace his lineage bishop by bishop, much like a family tree, all the way back to the apostle Andrew, the brother of Peter, the first called of the apostles. Andrew established the church and was the first bishop of what was then known as Byzantium, later Constantinople, now Istanbul, in the year 38. So when you read about the book of Acts in the Bible, you're reading about the Orthodox Church. Acts 9-11 mentions the church in Damascus on a street called Strait. Thankfully, despite the war in recent years, that little church still stands, and it has been and always will be a Greek Orthodox Church. When you go and read St. Paul's epistles to the Thessalonians, Corinthians, Philippians, he's writing to churches that still exist, and they are Greek Orthodox churches. Now, all of this historical background is important because Orthodoxy is understanding Christianity is that it has to be given to you. You have to receive it. It's not something you can just make up. Christ handed the church to his apostles. They handed it to their followers, and they've handed it all the way to us here in the 21st century. It's a gift, and a gift is treasured so that when it's handed again, it's not changed. Uh, much of the year of antiquity and timelessness that you'll see and feel in this church is an expression of the church's desire, hope, and prayer to hand on intact that which it has received. Uh, when you think of the word tradition, that's actually a Latin word. It means to hand on. And we can think of tradition as something that is a thing, it exists, it's there, but when we think of it as a verb, to give something, to hand on, it's an act. Now, what are the ways in which the church traditions things, to hand things on? Um, one, of course, is through the scriptures. During the first 400 years of the church's history, the Orthodox Church compiled the canon of the scriptures that all Christians know today as the Holy Bible. 
Now, in the Orthodox Church, the scriptures are central to everything we do, and yet the Bible for us is, in and of itself, not the faith. It's a tool that the church uses to teach the faith. To put it another way, we have a book that's based on the faith, rather than the other way around. Now, a summation of what we believe can be summed up in the Nicene Creed. Uh, a lot of churches use some formulation of the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, but for those of you who may not know, the Creed was written in the year 325 at the First Ecumenical Council in Nicaea. And this council was assembled by the Emperor Constantine because a heresy had become fairly widespread uh, from a priest named Arius in Alexandria, Egypt, and Arius and his followers were denying that Christ was divine. So the Creed was developed I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc. Uh, as an interesting historical side note, Arius was so controversial that St. Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra, yes, jolly old St. Nick himself, slapped Arius across the face. He was so outraged by this heresy. Uh, there's an interesting conclusion to the story. Um, St. Anthony the Great, the father of monasticism, who lived alone in a cave in Egypt, heard about this controversy that was happening, left his cave, at the age of 75, walked all the way from Egypt into Turkey, told Arius to his face that he was incorrect in front of this assembled crowd of bishops, and then promptly left and went back to his cave where he lived for another 35 years. Uh, now, if you're being slapped by Santa Claus and lectured by St. Anthony, you probably need to start rethinking your priorities. Uh, but thankfully, the Nicene Creed came out of it, which is a helpful summation of what the church believes. Now, what is an Orthodox service like? Well, if you've never been, it's really beautiful, and you should come and experience it for yourselves. Um, please join us. The church does welcome all. But when you come, I think it would probably be helpful to know a few things beforehand. Uh, the first is simply knowing the reason that we're here. We come to pray, to glorify God, and to commune with God through prayer and the sacraments. Uh, those of you who come from Protestant confessions will probably notice that the sermon is not the major focus. Uh, you can even see, just from not being in a service, that the pulpit is off to the side. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, we do love a good sermon. Uh, the liturgy that we celebrate weekly is the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means golden mouth, so that's how eloquent his sermons were. Um, so the sermon is important, but it isn't the central focus of our worship. Um, you should also know that despite the pews, there's a lot of standing during an Orthodox service. Uh, pews are obviously a modern, more Western invention, and if you were to go to a church in Greece or Russia or Bulgaria, you're not going to see a lot of pews. You would see a row of chairs around the sides, essentially for the elderly and infirm. Um, and the reason that we emphasize standing is because we're not here as spectators, it's work. Um, we're meant to stand at attention in prayer and worship um, so that we're united in prayer through the angelic coast and that it becomes heaven on earth when you're in this room. Now, I've used the word liturgy several times. Uh, what does liturgy mean? Now, for those of you who may not know, liturgy is a set offering of prayers and praises that are prayed and sung each week, wrote every single week. Now, the word liturgy literally means the work of the people. And I understand that some of you might be thinking the same prayers every single week. It's get a little repetitive, a little boring. You know exactly what's going to happen every single week. And the really is that despite the familiarity, it's not boredom because the more you repeat, the more a rhythm is established. And in that rhythm, your mind is calmed and then you experience a kind of inner stillness that really focuses your prayer. Uh, the Psalms say, be still and know that I am God. And the Greek word for it is isihia, a kind of inner stillness, an inner quiet that we seek in prayer. Uh, liturgical prayer is different. When we're reciting the Lord's Prayer or the Creed together, we're doing um, But St. Isaac the Syrian says, if you love truth, be a lover of silence. And what better lesson can the fathers of the church give us today in the 21st century uh, when we're so very rarely still and so very rarely quiet?
Now, you'll notice when you come here to the cathedral that a portion of our service is in Greek. Um, there are books to follow along, so no one gets lost in their translations, Greek and English comparatively. If you were to go into a Russian church, you might hear some Russian, an Antiochian church, Arabic, the same in a Romanian, a Bulgarian, a Serbian. But what's amazing is that no matter the language, we're all saying the same prayers, doing the same liturgy week after week. We read the same scripture passages. In all likelihood, the sermon will be based on the gospel reading for that week, so it's a variation on the same topic. Uh, so whether you're in an Orthodox church in Moscow or Jerusalem, in Damascus, in Athens, Greece, or Atlanta, Georgia, it is still one church. Um, you'll also notice that priests have their back to us 90% of the time, which is just to remind us that they're leading us, that we're all praying together. Uh, what goes on in our hearts is enormously important as part of prayer. Uh, and a good example of this is a conversion of Prince Vladimir of Kiev and of all of Russia. At a certain point, he was looking for a religion no longer pagan that would unify his culture in the royal court. And he sent emissaries to research the various religions that he would be interested in possibly converting to. And so they went and did their research and they went to Constantinople, to the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, which still stands today. No, not as an Orthodox church, but it's still standing. And when they went there, they wrote back to him and they said, when we stood in the temple, we hardly knew whether we were in heaven or on earth, for in truth, it seems impossible to behold such glory and magnificence on earth. We could not possibly relate to you what we saw in that place, but one thing we know in that place, God dwells among men. Now, what's fascinating, and the reason that I share this, is that it illustrates an important point about what goes on in your hearts during prayer. Remember, these Slavic envoys spoke Russian. They would not have understood a word of what was being said during this divine liturgy conducted entirely in Greek, and yet it reached them anyway. The one thing we know is that in that place, God dwells among men. Same who in the fifth century wrote, true theology isn't information about God, it's an experience of God. And that's the aim of what happens when you come in here each week, an experience of God. Now, a few things more before I move on to the icons about our church. We are a Trinitarian faith. We believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Orthodoxy believes that the Christian faith and the church are inseparable. We share fully in the life of the Trinity through the church when we receive the sacraments, and we Orthodox believe that Holy Communion is the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully I've answered a few of your questions about Orthodox Christianity. Uh, forgive me if I failed to do it justice. Uh, but if you took away a few things, I would hope it would be that the church is ancient yet timeless. It's full of wisdom, also humble and reverent and quiet. Now, there's a very esteemed bishop, unfortunately, as of a month ago, fallen asleep in the Lord, a very interesting man. He was born Timothy Ware, not a Greek name, not a Russian name. He was born into the Anglican faith in England in the mid-1930s, and he came to Orthodoxy, converted and became a priest, and eventually became a Greek Orthodox bishop. And uh, he would always teach. He was a very esteemed theologian, and when he taught at Oxford, he would always be pestered by students who were constantly about God and things of that nature, and he would always feel the need to explain to them that it's not the task of Christianity to provide answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as he is the th thing that causes us wonder. Mystery and wonder, two words the Orthodox Church is certainly comfortable with. So let's take that sense of mystery and wonder and apply it to the icons that surround us. Now, icons are the first things you'll notice when you enter an Orthodox church, and they are, as the Slavic envoy said, beautiful. But what they didn't know, and what a lot of people don't know, is that for an Orthodox Christian, uh, an icon is not an art object. Art is to be viewed. Icons are to be experienced. If scripture is a tool the church gives us, and tradition is a church the tool uses, 
Icons are tools that are meant to inspire us to prayer and to silent contemplation. You'll notice when you look around that all the icons are silent, no one is speaking, and that in that silence they express the inexpressible. Uh, we surround ourselves with these icons so that we're constantly reminded that the veil between this world and the next world is thin, and that God and his angels are right here. It's an interesting detail, unlike many Western confessions with steeples that top the churches, the idea of the church reaching to heaven, we have domes because we believe that this is the point at which heaven meets earth. God wants to be as close to the spirit. Um, and it's to show that Christianity is not just a mental exercise, but it involves the body. Um, there is a certain physicality about how we worship. When we kiss the icons, it's because we feel we have a relationship with Christ, his mother, and the saints. And we kiss an icon as one might kiss a photo of a grandmother, a parent, or a spouse. Now, an important distinction about our icons versus other Orthodox churches. Most Orthodox churches have icons that are on canvas or wood, painted. Uh, we have a rare blessing in that all our icons are mosaics. Uh, the mosaics were done by a Mr. Sirio Tonelli, who was not Orthodox when he began the project. He was born into the Roman Catholic faith, but converted to Orthodoxy um, shortly before he finished. Uh, he started the project with the six large panels, um, which are 22 feet high and 10 and a half feet wide. Uh, the back wall came next. It's called the Platitera Tonuranon, and then the dome. Uh, all these were completed in 1969. The icons outside in the narthex were done in 1978, and the icons across the back and the choir loft there were completed at a separate point. Uh, I'll now describe to you what's in each icon as if you were coming through the front doors of the church back there. You can't see what I'm describing, but it will be useful later. When you enter, you would look up and you'll see the large icon of Christ giving the Sermon on the Mount. To the left of that would be an, is an icon of the Resurrection. And by the candle stand, there's an icon of the Virgin Mary, or as we often refer to her, the Theotokos, which is an honorific that means uh, the one who gave birth to God. Now, continuing through the doors toward the lit candles, and these doors here, you'll see two large panel icons there. Uh, one is of an old man with a long beard on the left. That's St. Petros of Aragos, a bishop and wonder worker in a city in, called Aragos in the Peloponnesus. We have a number of families that are from Aragos, so he's a very important saint. And across from him is St. Catherine, who was a child martyr. Um, we've mounted both of their stories and placed them beside the icons, so that if you have a few minutes, uh, feel free to read them. They're very fascinating. Now, moving on to here within the nave. We'll start in order uh, with the back icon at the right corner there, the icon of the Nativity, otherwise known as Christmas. You'll see that this is a bit of an amalgamation. Um, you'll see Mary uh, lying in repose, having given birth to Christ, Christ lying in the manger. Um, an important distinction in Orthodox iconography is that a manger is not, as in the West, would be a barn or a stall, but in that part of the world likely would have been a cave outcropping in rock where animals would have been kept. Um, it's a bit of an amalgamation in the sense that you can also see uh, Christ being bathed by handmaidens. And uh, you'll see a man in green, that's Joseph. Uh, he looks like he's not having a particularly great day. <coughs> and the reason for this is, it's a detail Mr. Tonelli left out, but in most icons, Joseph is talking to an elderly man and the elderly man is a representation of the devil who is whispering doubts to him about Christ's divinity. Uh, this would have been an important theological point because it would have addressed the Arian heresy and refuted that Christ was in fact both fully man and fully divine. Moving on in sequential order is the first panel which of course refers to the icon of theophany or epiphany, the baptism of Christ. Um, 
and we call it a theophany, a revelation of God, because in this instance, in the icon, we have all three persons of God, all three persons of the Holy Trinity present. Christ the Son in the waters of the Jordan River, um, the voice of God saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, represented by that beam of light, and in the center of the light, uh, the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. You'll also see two creatures in the bottom of the river. Uh, they represent the rivers and seas, which reflects Psalm 114, verse 3, the sea saw and fled, the Jordan turned back at the presence of Christ, sanctifying the waters. Next panel is the icon of transfiguration. Christ transfigured in light on Mount Tabor, surrounded by a mandorla, the uncreated light, demonstrating his divinity to Peter, James, and John, who accompanied him to the mount, and who are shielding their eyes, seeing him only as far as they are able. To Christ's left is Elijah, and to his right, the prophet Moses, uh, holding the book of the law. It took years to realize that, thanks to Charlton Heston, that was not, in fact, Moses, but Elijah. <laughs> Moving on to the next panel in order, of course, is the crucifixion. Christ on the cross, below him the three Marys. Mary, his mother. Mary, the mother of James and Salome. And Mary Magdalene. And St. John the Evangelist. And theologian. And St. Joseph of Arimathea. An important distinction to make about Orthodox iconography is that it's more about the spiritual reality of the event as opposed to the physical reality. Orthodox rarely depicts the crown of thorns, but instead the crown of glory and the passion of the Christ is not emphasized so much as Christ's sacrifice. This is just after the moment he has declared it is finished and given up the ghost. Moving across the nave, the next panel is the resurrection icon, the Anastasis, Christ trampling on the doors of Hades. You'll see death, or Satan, in chains bound, having been defeated by Adam and free of knowledge of good and evil. They are surrounded by the prophets and kings of the Old Testament. You'll often see King David and King Solomon, and you'll always have John the Baptist, who we believe, of course, preached to those in Hades about the coming of Christ. And then, of course, the middle panel side, the ascension. Forty days after the resurrection, Christ ascended into heaven, flanked by angels, his mother, and the disciples watching. You can see the general air of calm that Mary and Christ have in contrast to the disciples who seem to be asking themselves, well, what happens now? And what happens now, of course, is answered in the last panel, the icon of Pentecost. Pentecost meaning 50 days, 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after the ascension of Christ, the disciples all gathered in the upper room. They've chosen Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Christ, completing the 12 and the tongues of fire have descended upon their heads to give them the ability to preach the gospel in all languages and representing the start of the earthly church. You also notice that there's a gap up at the top, which is a place for Christ, who is still the head of our church, even if he is not physically present. The final half dome, the Dormition, or the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. This icon is interesting because it's the only one within this series which depicts an event not found in canonized scripture. This event has been handed down to us through other writings that were not included as part of the Holy Bible, but are still found to be valuable in terms of information. And it tells us of the end of the Virgin Mary's earthly life. She is surrounded by all the disciples who have come to see her to pay their last respects. And Christ is holding in his arms her soul, wrapped in swaddling clothes, an interesting 
bit of parallelism to the icon of the nativity. He holds her as she once held him. You'll notice that one of the people missing is Thomas. Poor Thomas was always late, but there's an interesting ending to that story as well. Now, the back wall, of course, is out of chronological order. The icon of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, a week before Easter. And now, if I can have your attention back this way, from which the gospel is preached. St. Matthew is represented by the angel, St. Mark by the lion, Luke the ox, and John by the eagle. The raised platform behind me, called the Solea, has an icon of the double-headed eagle, a symbol of New Rome and the Byzantine Empire. The double-headed eagle represented the harmony between church and state that existed in the empire. And on the bishop's throne over there is an icon of Christ as the high priest. That brings us to the wall of icons behind me called the iconostasis. The distinguishing feature of all Orthodox churches today is something that developed over time in the earliest churches, uh, the separation between the altar and the people was rather like it would have been in the Jewish temple, a curtain. And after a time, they decided that the curtain should be replaced by a series of icons. And so you will find the same patterns and rules, essentially, in every single Orthodox church. In the center are the royal doors. To the left of the royal door is always an icon of Mary holding the Christ child. And to the right is always an icon of Christ, the ruler of all. There's a symbolic reason for this, of course, because everything that happens in those royal doors happens after Christ's incarnation, the first time, and before his second coming. To the right of Christ, Pantocrator, is always an icon of John the Baptist, and to the left of the Virgin Mary holding Christ is always an icon of the event or person after which the church is named. Our church, obviously, is the Church of the Annunciation, so the icon is of the angel Gabriel announcing the good Mary is to give birth to the Savior. To the right of St. John the Baptist is the door through which one enters the altar, which is always an icon of Archangel Gabriel. And on the left is an icon of Archangel Michael. The back wall, as I mentioned earlier, is called the Platitera Tonuranon, meaning more spacious than the heavens. And it refers to the Virgin Mary, who connected heaven to earth by giving birth to Christ. You will always find this icon of the Virgin Mary in a place of honor in our churches. Finally, that brings us back the icon of Christ, Pandocrator, the ruler of all. On each side, you'll see the letters I-C-X-E, Greek for Isus Christos. In Christ's halo are the letters Omega Omicron Nu, which literally means he who is, a reference, of course, to Moses in the burning bush, I am who I am. The dome has a total of three and a half million tiles, and the dome signifies Christ bending the heavens to hear our prayers. That completes our tour. We have handouts about the tour in the narthex. If you have questions, please feel free to come down, and I'll be happy to answer them individually. Our preschool and parochial school, kindergarten through eighth grade, the Annunciation Day School is giving tours tomorrow and Sunday from 11 to 5. There's a kid's tent to sign up, and a school representative will be happy to give you a personal tour. Thank you for coming, and enjoy the rest of the festival.
Hello, everyone. The uh, next tour starts at 7.30, so about 10 minutes. Uh, feel free to look around, and then um, when we're ready, I'll announce it. And uh, have a seat near the front so you can have the best view. Good evening. The tour will start in about five minutes. Um, if you'd like to keep looking around, but uh, have a seat. And near the front, you'll have the best vantage point. So thank you very much for coming.
Good evening. The tour will start in just a few minutes. If you'd like to, those in the back would like to come sit down uh, near the front. It's just about 25 minutes, and then uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, and then you're free to look around at the conclusion of the tour. So we'll start in just a second. Come sit up near the front. Your vantage point will be much better for referencing some of the icons later. Um, thank you very much for coming. I, it's been a couple of years, so I'm very pleasantly surprised to see how many people are here on a Friday night. Saturday and Sunday are usually our busier days. It's very wonderful to see all of y'all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Good evening. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoying our festival. Uh, my name is Nikos Topoulos, and on behalf of His Eminence, Metropolitan Alexios of Atlanta, Father Paul Kaplanis, Father Christos Mars, and all the faithful, I'd like to welcome you to the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral. It's my great joy today to hopefully answer a few of your questions about what Orthodox Christianity is, and then we'll take a quick tour around the icons that surround us here in the cathedral. But before we get too far into the church part of the tour, Let's talk about how we got here. Greek immigrants started arriving and settling in Atlanta in the 1890s, and they brought with them their culture, music, art, dancing, the food, and that sense of family and community that you see outside. But they also brought with them their religion, their faith, which you can see so beautifully manifested here in our cathedral. Our parish was founded in 1905 in a building downtown Atlanta on Garnett Street, and it was later moved to Pryor Street and then in 1965, ground was broken here on Claremont Road, and this building was consecrated in 1970. So, what does Greek Orthodoxy mean? Well, obviously the first thing you hear is Greek, uh, but since you're kind enough to join us and you've had a few minutes to look around, you've probably figured out that that is not Zeus. When you hear the word Greek in Greek Orthodox, it's important to think of more of the historical context of the language and rather than a country. A Greek was the common language, along with most of Hellenic culture, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. In fact, if you think about it, it had been that way long before the Roman Empire, thanks to Alexander the Great, who lived four centuries before Christ. And that's why the Gospels were all originally written in Greek. It was the common language for people who lived in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. You may also hear it referred to as Eastern Orthodox, or Russian Orthodox, or Antiochian, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian Orthodox. It's all the same thing. It's all one church. And there are over 300 million members of the Orthodox Church worldwide. In fact, the Orthodox Church is the second largest Christian confession in the world. Now, from a purely historical perspective, the Orthodox Christian Church was founded in 33 AD by the apostles themselves on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you can see Pentecost depicted in the icon just over your right shoulder, the third panel back. But we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that event when we come to the icon portion of the tour. Now, when I say that our church was founded by the apostles, we mean that literally. The church is within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, which is led by the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, what we refer to in modern times as Istanbul, Turkey. The current Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew can trace his lineage bishop by bishop, the bishop that ordained him and the one that was ordained prior to him, all the way back to St. Andrew the Apostle, the first called, the brother of Peter. We believe that St. Andrew founded the Church of Byzantium, later Constantinople, now Istanbul, in the year 38. So when you read the Book of Acts in the Bible, you're reading about the founding of the Orthodox Church. Acts 9-11 mentions a church in a street called Strait in Damascus, Syria. 
Thankfully, despite the horrible events of the war, that church still exists, and it is still a Greek Orthodox church. When you read Paul's epistles to the Thessalonians, Corinthians, Philippians, he's writing to churches that he established that still exist today, and they are Greek Orthodox churches. Now, all this historical context is important because Orthodoxy's understanding of Christianity is that it has to be given to you. You have to receive it. You can't just make it up. Christ handed the church to his apostles, and they handed it to their followers, and they've handed it all the way to us here in the 21st century. It's a gift, and a gift should be treasured so that when it's handed on again to successive generations, it's not changed. Much of the era of antiquity and timelessness you'll see and feel around you is an expression of the church's desire, prayer, and hope that it will pass on intact what it has received. The word in Latin, tradition, traditione, is an action. We tend to think of tradition as this idea of a thing, an object, to set aside alongside scripture, but tradition is an action. So another way the church has of handing on an experience of God is through the scriptures. During the first 400 years of the Christian church, the Orthodox Church compiled the canon of the scriptures that all Christians today know as the Holy Bible. And yet, for us as Orthodox, the Bible in and of itself is not the faith, but instead one tool to teach us about the faith. Put another way around, we have a book that's based on the faith, not the other way around. Now, a summation of what we believe can be found in the Nicene Creed. Now, there are many Christian confessions that use the Nicene Creed or some version of it, but for those of you who don't know, the Nicene Creed was written in the year 325 at the First Ecumenical Council in Nicaea, and the council was called by Emperor Constantine because a heresy had taken hold and gained a lot of ground started by a priest named Arius that stated that Christ was not in fact divine but was fully man. Uh, so the Nicene Creed was an agreed-upon formulation of everything the Orthodox Christian Church believed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc. Um, interesting side notes related to the Ecumenical Council. Arius was so enraging that St. Nicholas, Bishop of Mira, yes, jolly old St. Nick himself, slapped Arius across the face and was actually briefly thrown in jail for assault. Um, St. Anthony, the father of monasticism, who established the concept of Orthodox Christian monks and is the father of monasticism, was living in a cave in Egypt at the time, heard about the controversy, walked all the way to Turkey, told Arius to his face that he was incorrect in front of this group of assembled bishops, walked all the way back to Egypt, and lived in his cave for the next 35 years. If you're being slapped in the face by Santa Claus and lectured to by St. Anthony the Great, you probably should rethink some of your priorities. But in any case, we got the Nicene Creed out of it, which is, as I said, a handy summation of what we believe. So now that we have a thorough understanding of what it is the Orthodox believe, what exactly do we do here? What's an Orthodox service like? Well, if you've never been, it's indescribably beautiful. So you should come and experience it for yourselves. The church welcomes everyone, so please join us. But I do think it would be helpful to know a few things before you came. The first is, why are we here? Well, we come to pray and to glorify God and to commune with God through prayer and through the sacraments. Uh, those coming from Protestant confessions will notice that the service is not based around the sermon. Even the pulpit that you see is off to the side. It doesn't take center stage in a Greek Orthodox church. That isn't to say we discount the value and importance of sermons. Uh, the liturgy that we celebrate every week the Divine Liturgy according to St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means golden-mouthed because his sermons were that eloquent. So sermonizing certainly has a place in teaching the faithful. You should also know that in the Orthodox Church, standing during prayer is very important and very crucial. Uh, pews are obviously a Western development, and if you go to many old Orthodox churches and traditional Orthodox countries, you won't see pews. Uh, you'll see benches that l around the edge of the church for those who are infirm and those who are elderly. Um, and standing is emphasized because we're participants. Uh, unlike this lecture here, this tour here, we're not an audience. We're invoked and asked to be part of the work 
to pray as a community, to join our prayers with the angels and the saints who we believe surround us and who make this sanctuary the throne room of God. Now, I've used the word liturgy. What is a liturgy? A liturgy is simply a set set of offerings and prayers that are sung most often here in the Orthodox Church as one body each week. Now, the word liturgy literally means the work of the people. The divine liturgy is the divine work of the people. And for those who aren't as familiar with the concept of liturgical prayer and liturgical worship, it might seem a little repetitive. The same thing week after week, and yet, despite the familiarity, you don't get bored because through repetition, you get a rhythm. And in the rhythm, your mind is calmed and stilled and your thoughts are stilled. Remember, the psalmist writes, be still and know that I am God. The Greek word for it, isihia, denotes a kind of inner stillness, an inner quiet that we seek in private prayer. Now, when you're reciting the creed or saying the Lord's Prayer together, that's work, collective work that we all do as people. But in the words of St. Isaac the Syrian, he writes, if you love truth, be a lover of silence. And what better lesson can the fathers of the church pass down to us here in the 21st century? Because how often in our busy lives are we ever just still? And how often is it ever just silent? Now, you'll notice for some of our services here in the cathedral, they'll be conducted in Greek, and we have books for everyone to follow along, Greek and English translation, so that no one misses a single word. If you were in a Russian church, you'd hear Russian, in an Antiochian church, you'd hear Arabic, um, same in a Romanian, Bulgarian, Serbian Orthodox church. But what's amazing is that no matter the language or the accent, every Sunday we're reading the same prayers, doing the same liturgy. We'll read the same scripture passages. So the sermon that you hear would actually pretty much be based around the gospel and the same theme. So whether you're standing in an Orthodox church in Moscow, Damascus, Jerusalem, Athens, Greece, or Atlanta, Georgia, it's one church. There's a beautiful story that illustrates this in the conversion of the Slavic lands. Prince Vladimir of Kiev in all of Russia was at that point looking for a faith that could bind his royal court and his people together. And so he sent emissaries around and said, I want you to investigate all the world's religions, find out what you can, and then come back to me. Uh, interestingly, some of the prohibitions that he would have found in other religions against alcohol, he struck out because drinking is too dear to all the Russians and we couldn't ever adapt a religion that would eliminate drinking. So eventually the envoys came back and they were struck most by the fact that they went to the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom in Constantinople, which still stands today. It's currently not a church, but it's still there. And when they went in, they were stunned. And we have their letter, and they wrote to him that when we stood in this temple, we hardly knew whether we were in heaven or on earth, for in truth it seems impossible to behold such glory and magnificence on earth. We could not possibly relate to you what we saw in that place, but one thing we know, in that place, God dwells among men. Now, nice story, but the reason I share it and how it relates to the importance of what goes on in our hearts as part of prayer and how important really dwelling on prayer is that, remember, these Slavic envoys would not have spoken a word of Greek. They walked into the middle of a divine liturgy in Constantinople and had absolutely no idea what was being recited and were still that moved. The one thing we know in that place, God dwells among men. It just goes to show what St. Diadokos of Fotiki, all the way in the fifth century, true theology isn't information about God, it's an experience of God. And that's what you feel when you stand here and pray each week, an experience of God. That's certainly what the envoys must have felt when they wrote those words. A few last things to note before I move on to the icon portion. We are Trinitarian. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Orthodoxy believes that the Christian faith and the church are inseparable. We share fully in the life of the Holy Trinity through the church, where we receive the sacraments, and we Orthodox believe Holy Communion to be the true literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. Hopefully, I've answered a few of your questions about Orthodox Christianity. Forgive me if I failed to do it justice. 
but if you could take away a few things, I hope you would, I hope it would be that the church is ancient, but it's timeless. It's full of wisdom, yet it is humble, reverent, and quiet. There was a very uh, esteemed bishop, a very interesting man, uh, known as Metropolitan Callistos. His birth name was Timothy Ware. He was an Englishman born into the Anglican faith in the 1930s who converted to Orthodox Christianity in his 20s, became a priest, and eventually a Metropolitan Bishop. And he was a very learned and esteemed theologian and taught for many years at Oxford in England. Uh, he passed away about a month ago. Um, but it's important because he has a wonderful quote. His students are con were constantly peppering him with questions about God, and he reminded them that it's not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question you have, but rather to make you progressively aware of a mystery. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as he is the cause of our wonder. Mystery and wonder, two words the Orthodox Church is certainly comfortable with. With that being said, let's take that sense of mystery and wonder and apply it to the icons that surround us. Now, icons are the first thing that you'll notice when you enter an Orthodox church, and they are, like the Slavic envoys wrote, beautiful. But what they didn't know was that for the Orthodox Christian, an icon is not an art object. Art's to be viewed. Icons are meant to be experienced. As scripture is a tool the church gives us, and tradition is a tool the church uses, icons are a tool that are meant to inspire a person to prayer and silent contemplation. If you look around the icons, you'll notice that in none of them is anyone speaking. They express, through their silence, the inexpressible. Ours is a confession that surrounds ourselves with icons so that we're reminded that the veil between this world and the next one is thin, and that God and the angels are all right here. You will see us cross ourselves when we enter and kiss the icons. We cross ourselves so that bodily we acknowledge our belief in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christianity is not a mental exercise, but involves the whole body. There is a physicality to worship. We kiss the icons because we have a personal relationship with Christ, his mother, and the saints, just as we might kiss a photo of a grandmother, a parent, or a spouse. Most icons that you'd see in other Orthodox churches are painted on canvas or wood, and we have a rare blessing that our cathedral is done entirely in mosaic icons. The mosaics were done by Mr. Sirio Tonelli, who was not Orthodox when he began the project, but became Orthodox by the time he finished. He began with the six large panels, which are 22 feet high and 10 and a half feet wide, then this back wall behind me, called the Platitera Tonuranon, and then the dome all of which were completed in 1969. The icons in the narthex uh, behind us were completed in 1978, and the icons across us in the back in the choir loft were done later as separate projects. So now I'll walk you through each icon as if you were entering the church through the front doors. When you enter through the narthex, if you look up, you will see an icon of Christ giving the Sermon on the Mount. Just to your left would be an icon of the Resurrection, and by the candle stand, there's an icon of the Virgin Mary, or Theotokos, which is an honorific we give her, which means God-bearer. Now, as you proceed towards the lit candles in the narthex, you'll see, you probably notice the two large icons over there on the walls. One is of an old man with a long beard. That's St. Petros of Argos. He was a bishop and wonder worker, a miracle worker in Peloponnesos, a city known as Argos. And we have a number of families that are from that part of Greece, so he's a very important and revered saint. Across from him is St. Catherine, who was a child martyr. We have mounted both of their stories and placed them beside the icons, so if you have a few minutes afterwards, feel free to spend some time with them and read their very fascinating stories. Now, we'll start in the nave here. We'll start at the back corner in sequential order with the first half dome there, the nativity icon. You'll notice that this is a bit of an amalgamation because we see not only Mary lying in repose and Christ lying in the manger, but we also see Christ being washed by a group of handmaidens slightly older. Um, over there on the higher corner, you'll actually see the angels and the shepherds, the Annunciation to the shepherds in the Gospel of Luke. Um, in the lower corner there, the man in green is Joseph. 
Uh, a detail that Mr. Tonelli left out of the nativity icon that's depicted in most is that Joseph is talking to someone. You'll notice Joseph doesn't look very jubilant at this event. And that is because the old man that he is talking to in the icons is a depiction of the devil who's whispering the ancient Aryan heresy that Christ is not divine, but in fact human. Moving on to the first panel, again in relative order from December 25th to January 6th, the Feast of Theophany, Epiphany, the Baptism of Christ, and when all three persons of the Holy Trinity appeared in one time and place, Christ being baptized in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove, and surrounding the dove, the voice of God the Father, depicted in light, exclaiming, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Christ being baptized, of course, by John the Baptist, ministered to by angels, and the persons at the bottom in the River Jordan there are depictions of the seas and rivers in reference to the Psalms, which write, the sea saw and fled, the Jordan turned back. Middle panel there is an icon of the transfiguration. Christ on Mount Tabor, transfigured in all his glory, surrounded by the uncreated light. To Christ's left is the prophet Elijah with the white beard. To Christ's right, Moses holding the book of the law, not the one with the long white beard, which I was very surprised to learn. Thank you very much, Charlton Heston. Um, below them, Peter, James, and John, who of course ascended the mountain and are shielding their eyes, able to view his full divine glory only as far as they are able. Following that, of course, the crucifixion. Christ on the cross and below him, the three Marys, Mary his mother, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Salome. The other two gentlemen, St. John the Evangelist and Theologian, and St. Joseph of Arimathea. You'll notice in Orthodox depictions of the crucifixion that it's much more about, in Orthodox depictions of anything, it's much more about the spiritual reality of the event rather than the physical reality. There's no crown of thorns, instead a crown of glory. Uh, there's no suffering or violence. This is much more about Christ at the moment after he has uttered, it is finished, and has completed his salvific mission, or almost completed, because of course, across the nave, the icon of the resurrection, three days after the crucifixion. Christ trampling down the doors of Hades, Satan bound in chains, and Christ lifting Adam and Eve out of their tombs. You'll notice Eve is missing the hand that plucked the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They're surrounded by the prophets and kings of the Old Testament, including King David and King Solomon, and ordinarily John the Baptist is present as he preached to those in Hades that Christ was coming to liberate them and free us all from death. Of course, following that, your next center panel, the Ascension. 40 days after Pascha, or Easter, Christ, flanked by angels, leaving, ascending into heaven, his mother glorifying him. Notice that they look relatively serene. All the expressions of the disciples are both amazed and a little concerned because they're likely asking themselves, well, what happens now? And of course, what happens now is answered in the final six panels, final of the six panels, the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost meaning 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after the ascension, the disciples, the 11, plus Matthias, who was elected by Lot to replace Judas Iscariot, Christ's betrayer, are all gathered together in the upper room, awaiting, as Christ said, the coming of the Holy Spirit, who will guide them. Holy Spirit, of course, enters the room as if the rushing of a mighty wind, the Acts of the Apostles tells us, and settles upon the head of all the apostles as tongues of fire, which gives them the ability to preach the gospel in many languages and to go out and minister to the world. You'll notice also the gap up at the top, of course, is an invisible seat. Christ represented still as the head of the church, 
even if he is not physically present. The final half dome there is the only icon that is not taken from canonical scripture. We have, according to holy tradition, many stories of the lives of the saints that were not deemed worthy to go into the Bible, if only because when they were compiling them, they decided that what needed to go into the Bible were things that were necessary for understanding salvation. These other stories, such as the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary, were judged to be of interest and important to learn, but not essential. So those are part of holy tradition. From holy tradition, we learn that when the time came for Mary to leave this earth and to join her son, the disciples gathered to pay their final respects. We can see her lying in repose and Christ holding what looks to be a small child in his arms, which we take, of course, to be a representation of him holding Mary's soul. A nice bit of parallelism between the nativity icons. He holds her as she once held him. You'll also note that there are only 11. Thomas was late, of course. Poor Thomas, always late. But there's an interesting conclusion to that story as well. Now, across the back wall, the choir loft there, is the one icon that's out of sequence, of course. But as I said, it was completed much later. So that is Christ's entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, being greeted by the crowds as he enters the city. Now, if I can have your attention just back this way, there are even icons on the pulpit where the word of God is preached. And appropriately, the four icons there represent the four evangelists, Matthew the angel, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John represented by an eagle. The raised platform behind me is called the solea. And on the solea, you'll see a double-headed eagle. The double-headed eagle was the symbol of New Rome, or the Byzantine Empire, and the double heads represented the harmony of church and state. Over here is the bishop's throne, and on the bishop's throne is the icon of Christ as high priest, of course noting that the bishop sits in the place of Christ, having stepped in to guide Christ's flock. That brings us to the wall of icons called the iconostasis. Now, this wall here is a distinguishing feature of all Orthodox churches. If we think back to the earliest days, the altar was separated by a curtain, much as it would have been in the ancient temple, separating the Holy of Holies from the people who were able to gather in. Eventually, uh, columns were put up instead of a curtain, and it was decided, well, as long as there are columns, might as well decorate them with icons. And what developed is now essentially standard across every Orthodox church. So I'll explain the pattern here. First, of course, is the royal gates. The priest enters and exits through the royal gates, ordinarily. To the left of the royal doors is always an icon of Mary holding the Christ child. The icon to the right is always Christ as the ruler of all. The reason for this symbolism is that the icon on the left represents Christ's incarnation, his first coming, and the icon on the right represents the second coming. Everything that occurs within the altar occurs between the first and second comings. To the right of Christ is always John the Baptist. To the left of the Virgin Mary holding the Christ child is always an icon for which the church is named because we're the Church of the Annunciation. That, of course, is an icon of Gabriel giving Mary the good news, announcing to her that she is to be the birth of the Savior. To the right of John the Baptist is the door through which we enter the altar, which always is an icon of the Archangel Gabriel. And the left of door on this side is the door through which altar boys exit, and the icon of Archangel Michael. The back wall, of course, as I previously briefly referred to, is called the Plati Terra Donura Non, which means more spacious than the heavens. And you'll always see an icon of the Virgin Mary in this place. And the reason for this is just as the ceiling connects the floor through that wall, Christ came down from heaven, taking flesh from Mary's womb, and became man. So the Virgin Mary will always be honored with this symbolic icon there. Finally, 
that brings us to the dome. The icon of Christ, Pantocrator, meaning ruler of all. And on each side, you see the Greek letters IC, XC, the Greek abbreviations for Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. Within Christ's halo are the letters Omega, Omicron, Nu, On, which is an abbreviation for He Who Is. Of course, a reference to God's answer to Moses in the burning bush, I am. The dome has a total of three and a half million tiles, and the dome signifies Christ bending the heavens to hear our prayers. That completes our tour. We have handouts for further information about the tour in the narthex, and if you have any questions, please feel free to come down and I'll be happy to answer them. Our preschool and kindergarten through eighth grade parochial school and Annunciation Day School will be giving tours tomorrow and Sunday from 11 to five. We have a kid's tent to sign up, and a school representative will be happy to give you a personal tour if you wish. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the festival.
Good evening, everybody. We're going to be starting the tour in about five minutes or so, so come on in, down, have a seat. It's about 30 minutes of a tour, so it's not, we're not going to keep you here for very long, so come on in, have a seat. Don't be shy, come on in, have a seat. We're gonna start the tour in, what, four minutes? And I'm quick, so.
come on in. We're uh, going to do the tour in about 30 minutes. Sorry, about two minutes. It's about a 30 minute tour. And I'll talk fast. So y'all can get, these people need to go eat. So, you know. Okay, close enough for rock and roll. How y'all doing? My name's Scott Davenport, and on behalf of his eminence, Metropolitan Alexios of Atlanta, that's our bishop, Father Paul Kaplanis, our dean, Father Christos Mars, and all of our faithful, welcome to the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral. Like, wow, right? Well, it is my great joy today to hopefully answer a few of your questions about what Orthodox Christianity is, and then we'll take a quick tour around the iconography that surrounds us here in this space. But before we get too far into the church part of the tour, let me just tell you how we got here. You see, Greek immigrants started to arrive and settle in Atlanta in the 1890s, and they brought within their culture, right, which you can see on display outside, the music, the art, the dancing, of course, the food. Thank you for bringing the food. Um, but they also brought with them their faith, their religion, which you can see so beautifully manifested here in our cathedral. Our parish was established in 1905 in a building in downtown Atlanta on Garnet Street. They later moved to Pryor Street, and then in 1965 broke ground here on Claremont Road, and this building was consecrated in 1970. So that's how we got here. All right, so Greek Orthodoxy. What does that mean? Well, interestingly, the Orthodox Church is the second largest Christian confession in the world, and yet many people in the United States have never even heard of the Orthodox Church. So what is orthodoxy? What's Greek Orthodox mean? Well, obviously the first word people hear is Greek, and you know, that can throw some folks off. But since y'all are kind enough to join us, you've had a minute to look around a bit, you've probably already figured out now that we don't worship Zeus, right? So disappointing, like, wait a minute, that's not Zeus. Um, Actually, the word Greek and Greek Orthodoxy is a reference to the language and the culture rather than the country. You see, Greek was the common language of the eastern part of the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. In fact, it had been that way for quite some time, even before the Roman Empire, thanks to Alexander the Great, who lived in 4 BCE. So when you hear the term Greek Orthodox, think eastern part of the Roman Empire. You also may have heard the term Eastern Orthodoxy. It's the same thing but you also may have heard of Russian Orthodox or Antiochian Orthodox, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian Orthodox. Well, it's all one church, and there's over 300 million members of the Orthodox Church worldwide. From a purely historical perspective, the Orthodox Church was founded by the apostles themselves on the day of Pentecost, which we have an icon of, the third panel back, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the icons. But when I tell you that our church was founded by the apostles, we actually mean that literally. This church is within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, and that is led by the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, one of the first original five ancient patriarchates, the others being um, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and of course Rome. The current ecumenical patriarchate, patriarch, Bartholomew, can trace his line, his lineage, bishop by bishop, just like you would a family tree, all the way back to the Apostle Andrew, the first called, Peter's brother, who established the church and was the very first bishop of what was then Byzantium, later Constantinople, in the year 38 of the Common Era. Just for the record, Peter is credited with being the first bishop of both Antioch and Rome, uh, Mark, Alexandria, and James, the first bishop of uh, Jerusalem. So when you're reading in the Bible, in the book of Acts, you're actually reading about the Orthodox Church. For example, Acts 9-11 mentions a church in Damascus on a street called Straight. Well, thankfully, despite the war in that country, that little church still stands today. It is and has always been a Greek Orthodox church. When you read St. Paul's letters, his epistles to the Corinthians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, he's writing to churches that he established that, again, still exist to this day, and those two are Greek Orthodox churches. And I tell you this not simply to say, hey, we've got an old church. Um, <laughs> but rather to suggest that we have a, a faith and a tradition that reaches from the first pages of the Old Testament to the last pages of the New. It's important because Orthodoxy's understanding of Christianity is that it has to be given to you. You have to receive it. 
You can't just make it up. You know, Christ hands the church to his apostles. They hand the church to their followers around them, and they've eventually handed it to us here in the 21st century. It's a gift. And that gift should be treasured so that when it's handed on again, it's not changed or perverted in any way. I mean, look around. I mean, much of the air of antiquity, of timelessness that you sense and you feel around you is the church's hope and desire and prayer to hand on intact that which it has received. The word in Latin that means to hand on is something you might be familiar with. It's traditione, tradition, a verb, to tradition something. You know, we often think of tradition in kind of a debased sense, as if it were a kind of thing, so we can set it alongside scripture and compare the two. But they're not things that can be compared. Tradition is an action. It's an act of handing on. Another way the church has of handing on an experience of God is through the scriptures. For the first 400 years of the church's history, the Orthodox Church collected the canon of scripture that the world today would recognize, of course, as the Bible. And so for us, the scripture is central to everything that we do. And yet for us, the Bible in and of itself isn't the faith, but rather one critical tool that the church gives us to teach the faith. Put another way, scripture points to someone greater than itself. If you'd like to find a summary of what we believe, you can certainly find it in the Nicene Creed. Uh, we're not the only church to use the Creed, of course, or a version of it. But for those of you who may not know, the Creed was written in the year 325 in the first ecumenical council held in Nicaea, Greece. This was a council called by the Emperor Constantine uh, to address a heresy by a priest named Arius from Alexandria and some of his followers who denied Christ's divinity. Interestingly, at that council, St. Nicholas was there, like the St. Nicholas, jolly old St. Nick. Well, jolly old St. Nick walked up to Arius and slapped him across the face so hard he knocked him out, and they threw St. Nicholas in jail for assault. Um, by the way, there's a great end to that story. Also, at that council, St. Anthony the Great of Egypt, the father of monasticism, left his cave in the Egyptian desert at the foot of Mount Sinai, at the age of 70 years old, traveled all the way to Nicaea just to tell Arius that he was wrong in front of everybody, and then turned around and went back to his cave in the desert where he lived for another 30 years. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I think when you're getting lectured by St. Anthony and slapped around by Santa Claus, I think it's time for you to wrap it up and reevaluate some of your positions on a few things, but that's just me. So, what's an Orthodox service like? Like, what do we do here? Well, if you've never been to an Orthodox service before, please come and join us. We welcome everybody. The church welcomes all people. We'd love to have you. Pick a Sunday and come and join us. But when you come, I do think it might be helpful for you all to know a few things going in, right? I mean, I remember walking through those doors, gosh, about 30 years ago, and it would have been nice if my girlfriend, future wife at the time, would have clued me in on a few things, right? So let me just share with you some things that I think you might help. Um, the first one is knowing the reason why we're here, the purpose of our services, is the communion of God and man through prayer and through the sacraments, specifically the sacrament of communion, right? Uh, biblical uh, worship from the time of Cain and Abel has always meant sharing a meal with God. Christianity just inverts that, and God offers himself as sacrifice to us. So we come here to pray, to glorify God, and to commune with God through prayer and through the sacraments. Now, those of us coming from some of the Protestant confessions will immediately notice that the focus is not on the sermon, right? Even the pulpit is ticked off to the left over there. Don't get me wrong, I mean, we appreciate a good sermon just like the next guy. Even our liturgy is named after St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means the golden mouth. So eloquent were his sermons. So we love a good sermon. It's just not the reason why we're here or the purpose of our services. You will also notice pretty quickly, and this takes a little getting used to, that we Orthodox stand when we pray. We don't sit, we stand as one stands before God. In fact, many Orthodox churches don't even have pews, so they forgo even an opportunity of sitting down, except for a few benches around the outside for the elderly and the infirmed. There's even a meme on the internet that says, Orthodox Christianity, standing room only since 33 AD. So we will be standing for much, if not all, of the service. Um, but we stand because we participate in the liturgy, we're, right? We're not an audience. Our prayers are joined with those of the angelic hosts, and together it becomes heaven on earth, the throne room of God. The word liturgy literally means the work of the people, not the work of the priest or the choir or the chanters, but the work of the people. Speaking of liturgy, our services are liturgical, 
And again, we are not the only church to have a liturgy, but for those of you who may not know, a liturgy is simply a standard set of prayers and praises, prayed, sung, often here in the Orthodox Church, chanted as one body each week. And you know, for the uninitiated, this might seem repetitive. I mean, it's the same liturgy every week. And yet, somehow, I guess, through the repetition or through the familiarity, there's a repetition, and through that repetition, there's a rhythm to it. And through that rhythm, the mind is calmed and the thoughts are stilled. Remember, it says in the Bible, be still and know that I am God. The Greek word for it is isihia. There's an inner stillness, sort of an inner quiet that we seek in prayer, especially private prayer. Corporate prayer, liturgical prayer is somewhat different. As I said, there's work to be done. But, you know, in the words of St. Isaac the Syrian, if you're a lover of truth, be a lover of silence. And really, what better lessons than these can the church fathers hand down to us here in the 21st century? Because in our busy lives today, when are we ever just still? And when is it ever, especially if you're a parent, quiet? Now, you will also notice, at least here in the cathedral, at least part of the services will be done in Greek. Not a lot, but parts. And we have books for everyone so that no one misses a single word. If you're in a Russian Orthodox Church, you probably hear some Russian, Antiochian, perhaps Arabic, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian Orthodox Churches, probably some of those languages. But what's really cool is, is that Sunday we'll all be saying the same prayers, reading the same liturgy, reading the same gospel and epistle readings. And whatever the topic of the sermon is that day, it'll most likely be on the same exact topic. So whether you're standing in a church in Jerusalem or Athens or Moscow or Atlanta, Georgia, it's still one church. I also think you'll find that whatever's going on in here in the heart is equally as important as to whatever's going on, on up there, right? Like I said, we're not an audience and they're not putting on Les Mis, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, the, so what goes on in our hearts is really, in fact, the priests actually have their backs to us about 90% of the time, just to remind us that we're all praying to God together. So what goes on in our hearts is really important, and there's a wonderful story that illustrates this beautifully with the conversion of the Slavic lands. Prince Vladimir, Vladimir of Kiev and all of Rus wanted to attach a religion to his court. So being a good leader, he sent out emissaries all around the world and said, go and find out about the world's religions, report back to me, we'll pick the best one. And they went all over. They went to Rome, they went to Germany. The, the Christian church hadn't officially broken apart yet, but there were long-standing cultural differences. They went to the Muslim court. One group went to Constantinople, to the Church of Hagia Sophia, to the Church of Holy Wisdom, where you can still go today. And this is what they wrote back to the prince. They said, when we stood in the temple, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For in truth, we did not know that one could behold such beauty and such magnificence on earth. We cannot possibly relate to you what we saw in that place. But the one thing we know is in that place, God dwells among men. And all the worship of other nations is to us evermore as nothing. We cannot possibly relate to you what we saw in that place. Whoever has seen so sweet a sight will no longer be satisfied with anything else. Nor will we consent to remain in paganism any longer as we are now. Strong words to the prince, right? We won't consent? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and if anyone's seen statues of Vladimir, he doesn't look like someone to be trifled with. Neither does his mother, for that matter. So, and the reason why I share the story with you and how it relates to what goes on in our hearts is that these Slavic envoys weren't Greek speakers. They wouldn't have understood a single word that was being said, no catechesis whatsoever, and yet they write back to the, the prince such strong language. The one thing we know, we know. St. Diodicus of Fatiki once said that true theology isn't information about God, but in its experience of God. And that's what I feel when I come here and pray each week, is an experience of God. I certainly think that's what the envoys must have felt when they stood in Hagia Sophia so many years ago. So, before we get to the icons, really quickly, we are, the Orthodox are um, Trinitarian. We believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the faith and the church are inseparable, that we live life fully within the church, through the church, where we receive the sacraments, and we believe the sacrament of communion to be the literal, true blood and body of Christ. So I hope that gives you a sense, perhaps, in the last 15 minutes of what Orthodox Christianity is. I guarantee you I haven't done it justice. Um, 2,000 years of Christian history, Scott, go! Um, but if you could take away a few things, I would hope it would be that the church is ancient and yet timeless. 
It's full of wisdom and still humble and quiet. I also like to keep this in mind anytime I'm giving these talks. There's a British bishop in our church, Callistos. He actually just passed away two weeks ago. He taught for years at Oxford in England, and his students at Oxford were always peppering him with questions about God. And he reminded them, he said that it is not the task of Christianity to provide simple answers to every question, but rather to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God, he said, is not so much the object of our knowledge as he is the cause of our wonder. Mystery and wonder. These are two, certainly words and concepts that we're comfortable with here in the Orthodox Church, and so let's apply them to the iconography all around us. I'm sure that the icons are the first thing that you notice when you walked in the church, right? And they are, just like the Slavic envoy said, beautiful. But what they didn't know at the time, perhaps, is that for the Orthodox Christian, this isn't just art, right? Art is to be viewed. Icons are to be experienced. And really, icons should always be thought of as tools, right? Scripture is the tool that the church uses. Tradition is another tool that the church uses. Icons as well are tools. Tools that are meant to inspire us to prayer and silent contemplation. If you'll notice, all of their mouths are closed. In fact, even the icons are quiet. And through their silence, they express the inexpressible. You see, ours is a confession of Christianity that surrounds itself with iconography in order to remind itself that the veil between this world and the next is thin, and that God and the saints and the angels, they're all right here because God wants to be as close as possible to his creation that he loves. Now, you will see us cross ourselves and kiss the icons. There's a simple reason for this. Don't freak out. We're not worshiping iconography. We cross ourselves so that we bodily, physically acknowledge our belief in the Holy Trinity, right? For us, Christianity is not just a mental exercise. It includes the entire person. And we kiss the icons for the same reason why I might kiss a picture of my wife if I were on a long road trip away from her, right? I can't see her physically in front of me, but I can always pull a picture of her out of my wallet and kiss it goodnight before going to bed. Same thing applies. We have a relationship with Christ, his mother, and the saints. We know and love them, and we kiss them the same way we would family members, right? Um, it's a distinction. So most icons that you find are paint on wood or paint on canvas. We have a rare blessing with our mosaic icons. These icons were done by Mr. Sirio Tonelli, who was not orthodox when he began the project, but became orthodox by the time he finished the project. Um, he started with the six panels on the side, which are 22 feet wide and 10 and a half, I'm sorry, 2 to 22 feet high and 10 and a half feet wide. Uh, then this back panel here called the Platitera, Tono Ranon, we'll come to that in a minute, and then the dome. All of that was completed in 1969. Um, the, uh, the narthex was done in 78, and then this back panel here was a later project. So now I'll just go through each of the icons and touch on them very, very briefly, as if you were coming through our front doors. So when you walk in, if you look up, you'll notice a really big icon of Christ giving the Sermon on the Mount that's in there. Uh, by the way, I was coming here for like five years and never noticed it. I'm like, hey, where did that come from? Anyway, um, as you walk in, then to your left, as you're walking in, uh, an icon of the resurrection, and to the right, by the candle stand on this side, you'll notice an icon of the Virgin Mary, uh, or Theotokos. Theotokos means the God-bearer, and is the title by which you'll hear most Orthodox Christians refer to the Virgin Mary by. As you proceed towards the candles and the doors of the nave here, you'll notice two large icons on the walls. One is, a, is of an old man with a long, beautiful white beard. This is St. Petros of Argos, the bishop and wonder worker of Peloponnese. We have a number of families from the Peloponnese area of Greece, so he's very important to us. And then across from him, St. Catherine. If you've ever heard of the term Catherine wheel, this is where that comes from. We've also um, put their stories beside their icons. If you have a few moments, spend some time. They really are really, really interesting stories. Now, here within the nave, the cool thing about icons, by the way, is that these are teaching tools, right? For until the printing press, nobody had a Bible that they could take home. So the really cool thing about icons is that you can take the smallest child and teach them a lesson, or the brightest theology student, and it's all within these uh, icons. And we'll start in the corner up there with the nativity icon. This is a bit of an amalgamation icon, as it, is, as it shows Christ as an infant, but also as a young boy. Um, so the simple uh, you know, story of Christ's nativity, Christ coming into the world. You'll also notice in the green there, Joseph. Joseph looks like he's having a bad day. Well, 
in most versions of this icon, Mr. Tanelli chose to leave this part out, but in most versions, Joseph is talking to an old man, and that old man is Satan, and Satan is whispering into his ear that the child is really not divine, which harkens back to the Arian heresy that I mentioned earlier, so that's why that's there. So, simple story of Christ's coming into the world, or the intricacies of Christology and the Arian heresy, wherever you want to go, it's all there, right? Next, we have Christ's baptism in the River Jordan. Um, picture you see Christ. Um, uh, now, this, I'm sorry, this icon also is named Theophany and Epiphany. Uh, Theophany and Epiphany mean vision of God. And the reason why this icon bears those titles is that the participants of this event heard the voice of God the Father say, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. They saw Christ in the flesh, and then they observed the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove. And so, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, vision of God, Theophany. You also notice the two figures on the bottom. They represent the River Jordan and the seas. When Christ entered the Jordan, the River Jordan changed directions. And it was written in the Psalm, Psalm 114.3, that the seas saw and fled, the River Jordan turned back. So that's why those figures are there. Next we have our transfiguration icon, Christ transfigured in light on Mount Tabor. Picture you have Christ enveloped in what's called a mandorla. Mandorla is an Italian word that simply means almond, but represents the uncreated light. To his left, the prophet Elias, or Elijah, and to his right, the prophet Moses. Moses is the one holding the book of law, not the one with the long white beard. And below them, Peter, John, and James, who ascended the mountain and beheld Christ in his glory as far as they were able. Next, of course, the crucifixion icon, Christ on the cross. Christ, below Christ are the three Marys, Mary the mother of God, the Theotokos, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Salome. To the right, St. John the theologian and Joseph of Arimathea. Within this icon, you will rarely see the crown of thorns. Most often we replace the crown of thorns with the crown of glory, the halo, and you're not necessarily to see Christ suffering his passion as much as you are to see his sacrifice. This is just after he's uttered the words, it is finished. Next, across from there is, of course, the resurrection icon, uh, Christ's descent into Hades. Pictured, you see Christ trampling down the doors of Hades. You see death in chains. You see, um, Christ is lifting Adam and Eve out of the tombs, and they are surrounded by the kings and prophets of old. You'll often have King David and King Solomon in this icon, and you will always, always have St. John the Baptist in this icon. Next, we have the ascension icon. For, uh, 40 days after the resurrection, Christ ascended into heaven. Pictured in this icon, you always have Christ and his mother being very calm, but there's always a tumult around Mary. And the reason for that was is that everyone was wondering, okay, well, what do we do now? What happens next? Next, we have that, those answers, those questions were answered 10 days later on Pentecost. Pentecost literally means 50 days. Pictured you have the 12 apostles, 12, because according to Acts chapter 2, they had replaced Judas Iscariot with Matthias. You'll also notice above their, each of their heads a flame. It had been written in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of flame. And so above each of their heads is a tongue of flame. You'll also notice a gap at the very top of this icon. In most versions, it's actually a little bit larger. That gap is the seat for Christ as he is the head of our church. And... Um, and, and he is invisibly present within that icon. Next, up in the corner there, and now this is the only icon that doesn't come to us from canonized scripture. This is called the Dormition of the Theotokos. This is the death of the Virgin Mary. And this scene has been handed down to us from other traditions. Now, pictured you have 11 of the 12 apostles, 11 because poor Thomas was late again. Um, and then you see, you see pictured Christ holding what looks like an infant. That's Mary's soul. She is in his arms now. He holds her as she once held him. Then across the back here is Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The, uh, this is our, our uh, Palm Sunday icon. This is the only icon out of these icons that comes to us out of chronological order. But as I mentioned, it was a later project. Now, a couple of things before we go. Uh, back this way, if I could get your attention. The pulpit even has icons on it. They represent the four Gospels that are preached from the pulpit. Um, Matthew is the angel, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John the eagle. On this vase platform here is an icon of, the, uh, of a two-double-headed eagle. They represent um, both sides of the Roman Empire looking east and west. 
and then the uh, bishop's throne it always has an icon of Christ the high priest on it. Now that brings us to this big wall of iconography here. And this is a distinguishing feature in all Orthodox churches uh, today. And this is something that did develop over time. In the earliest churches, they just had a curtain around the altar, and then they took the curtain down and put just uh, pillars around it. And then they put icons in front of the pillars, and it developed into this over time. And so now all iconography, all iconostasis follow the same patterns, the same rules, and they are these. So in front, we have what's called the royal doors. To the right of the royal doors is always an icon of Christ, Pantocrator, ruler of all. To the left of the, of the royal doors, to Christ's right, is always an icon of the Virgin Mary. If you look through Kings, um, all through it, the Davidic kings always said this was, the, this was the king and this was his mother, and then she sits at his right hand. Mary's at his right hand, um, always. To the left of Christ is always an icon of John the Baptist. And then to the right of John the Baptist is the door through which we enter the altar that always has an icon of um, the Archangel Gabriel on it. Then to the left of Mary, that panel always has an icon for which the church is named. In this case, it's the Annunciation. If our church was named the Holy Trinity, we'd have a Holy Trinity icon in that case, in that, on that panel. But in this case, it's the Annunciation icon where the Gabriel announced to Mary that she would uh, bear Christ. And then on the door on the left is always an icon of the Archangel Michael. Uh, we exit the icon, through, we exit the altar through Michael. Then this back panel here, it's the Platitera Ton Oranon, and it will always have a, a, an icon of the Virgin Mary. There's a reason for that. That wall can touch the ceiling and the floor. And Christ took flesh from Mary's womb and became man. And so you'll always have an icon of the Virgin Mary in that spot. And then finally, the dome. The dome itself is representative of God bending the heavens to hear our prayers. You see Christ, the icon itself is Christ Pantocrator, ruler of all. You'll notice the Greek letters ICXC. This is an abbreviation of Jesus Christ, Isu Christe. And then within his halo, the Greek word ohon, which means the one who is, which were the words spoken through the burning bush. And just one last note, there are 3.5 million tiles in the size of your little fingernail, one digit of your little fingernail, in the dome alone. And that is our, our tour today, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you all enjoy the festival. Thank you so much for coming out. If you all have any questions, come down. We're here to answer any questions. And please enjoy the rest of our festival.
δέσποτα Χριστέ ο Θεός, ο της πάθες Ιησού τα πάθη μου θεραπεύσας και της τραύμας Ιησού τα τραύματα μου γιατρεύσας. Χάρισέ μου το πολλά συπτές σαν τη δάκρυα κατανήξεως. Συγκέρασό μου το σώμα από σμής του ζωπιού σώματός σου και γλύκανό μου την ψυχή το σωτιμίο αίματι από της πικρίας την με αντίδικο σε πότισε. Ήψωσον το νου μου προσε κάτω ελκυσθέντα και να γαγέμε από του χάσματος της απολίας ότι ουκ έχω μετάνοια, ουκ έχω κατάνοιξη, ουκ έχω δάκρυον παρακλητικών τα επανάγοντα τα τέκνα προς την ιδία νοικογερονομία. Εσκότης με το νου την της βιωτικής πάθηση και εκεί σχείο ατενήσε προς ενωδύνη. Ουδή να με θερμανθεί με της δάκρυση της προς η αγάπη σας. Αλλά δέσποτα Κύριε Ιησού Χριστέ, ο θησαυρός των αγαθών, δόρισε με μετάνιαν ολόκληρον και καρδίαν επίπονον εις αναζήτησήν σου. Χάρισε με την χάρη σου και να κένισον ενεμή τα σμορφάς της εικόνος. Κατέ λοιπόν σε, μη με καταλήτης, έξελεθε εις αναζήτησήν μου, επανάγαγέ με προς την ομήν σου, συναρρύθμισό με τις προβάτης της εκλεκτής σου πίμνης και διάτρεψό με συναυτής εκ της χλόης των θείων σου μυστηρίων. Πρεσβείες της Πανάγνου Μητρός σου και πάντο των Αγίων σου. Αμήν. Should we call it? Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. Sorry. I'll brief you next. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I don't need him. I think I'm, I'm loud enough on my own. Scott. Mars. Hey, Mars. Just like Father Mary. Check, check. Y'all enjoy your thing. Have y'all eaten? <laughs> y'all enjoy yourselves, all right? Good to meet you guys. Pleasure to meet you. You too. Come on in. We're going to do another tour here in a second. Come on in. Uh, in like one minute, as a matter of fact. Gosh. It's going to be a light crowd here at 930, but that's OK. We normally, y'all look sober. That's kind of weird. We normally get the, uh, normally, 9.30 is normally, you got like five guys in the back drunk, trying to sleep it off a little bit. Gosh. Have a seat. We're going to, uh, this is like a 30 quick little 30 minute tour. And if I do it as fast as I did the last time, it's gonna be like 40, 20 minutes because I was, I had a cup of coffee and apparently that's bad. So, okay. Welcome, you guys. Um, let's get started. Are you ready? Anybody else wanna come join us? No? It's just us kids, all right. Hey, y'all, my name's Scott Davenport, and on behalf of his eminence, Metropolitan Alexios of Atlanta, Father Paul Kaplanis, our dean, and Father Christos Mars, welcome to the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral. 
wow, right? It's, uh, it really is my great joy today to hopefully answer a few of your questions about what, what Orthodox Christianity is, and then we'll take a quick tour around the icons that surround us here in this space. But before we get too far into the church part of the tour, let's just talk about how we got here, right? So, Greek immigrants started to arrive and settle in Atlanta in the 1890s. And they brought within their culture, right, that you can see on display outside, the, the music, the art, the dancing, of course, the food. Um, but they also brought with them their faith, their religion, which you can see so beautifully manifested here in our cathedral. Our parish was established in 1905 in a building in downtown Atlanta on Garnet Street. They later moved to Pryor Street and then in 1965 broke ground here on Claremont Road. And this building was consecrated in 1970. So that's how we got here. So what's Greek Orthodoxy? What does that mean? Well, interestingly, the Orthodox Church is the second largest Christian communion in the world. And yet many here in the United States have never even heard of the Orthodox Church before. So what is Orthodoxy? What's Greek Orthodox mean? So. Obviously, the first word people hear is Greek, and I'm not going to lie, that can throw some folks off, but since y'all are kind enough to join us, if you had a minute to look around a bit, you've probably already figured out by now we don't worship Zeus, right? So disappointing. Wait, wait a minute, that's not Zeus. Um, actually, the word Greek in Greek Orthodoxy is a reference to the language, not the country. You see, Greek was the common language of the eastern part of the Roman Empire at the time of Christ, Latin being the common language of the West, Greek in the East. And so when you hear the term Greek Orthodox, you think eastern part of the Roman Empire, right? Uh, that's why the Gospels were all originally written in Greek. It was a common language for the people that lived in that part of the world, right? So when you hear the term Greek Orthodox, you think, th think you know, East Greek Orthodox, think eastern part of the Mediterranean. You also hear um, uh, eastern you know, Russian Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian Orthodox. Well, it's all one church, and there's over 300 million members of the Orthodox Church worldwide. From a purely historic perspective, the Orthodox Church was founded by the apostles themselves on the day of Pentecost in the year 33 AD, which we have an icon of just over your right-hand shoulders, the third panel back, and we'll discuss that a little bit more when we get to the icons. But when I tell you all that our church was founded by the apostles, we actually mean that literally. This church is within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America and is led by the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, one of the five original ancient patriarchates, the others being Rome, uh, Antioch, Alexandria, and Jerusalem. The current Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew can trace his line, his lineage, bishop by bishop, just like you would a family tree, all the way back to the Apostle Andrew, the first called, Peter's brother, who established the church and was the very first bishop of what was then Byzantium, later Constantinople, in the year 38 AD. Uh, for the record, uh, Peter is credited with being the first bishop of both Antioch and Rome, Mark, Alexandria, and James, the first bishop of Jerusalem. So when you're reading the Bible and the book of Acts, you're actually reading about the Orthodox Church. For example, Acts 9-11 mentions a church in Damascus on a street called Straight. Thankfully, despite the war in that country, that little church still stands today. It is and has always been a Greek Orthodox church. When you read St. Paul's letters, his epistles to the Corinthians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, etc., he's writing to churches that he established that still exist to this day, and those two are Greek Orthodox churches. And so I tell you that not simply to say that we have an old church, but rather to say that we have a, a faith and a tradition that reaches to the first pages of the Old Testament to the last pages of the New. It's important because Orthodoxy's understanding of, of, orth of Christianity is that it has to be given to you. You have to receive it. You can't just make it up. Christ hands the church to his apostles. They hand the church to their followers around them, and they have handed it to us here in the 21st century. It's a gift. And that gift should be treasured so that when it's handed on again, it's not changed or perverted in any way. And they look around. Much of the air of antiquity, of timelessness that you sense and you feel around you is the church's hope and desire and prayer to hand on intact that which it has received. The word in Latin that means to hand on is something you might be familiar with. It's traditione, tradition, a verb, to tradition something. 
You know, we often think of tradition in a much debased sense as if it were a kind of thing so that we can set it alongside scripture, right? And so we can compare the two, scripture and tradition. But they're not things that can be compared. Tradition is an action. It's an act of handing on. Another way the church has of handing on an experience of God is through the scriptures. For the first 400 years of the church's history, the Orthodox Church collected the canon of scripture that the world today would recognize, of course, as the Bible. And so for us, scripture is central to everything that we do. And yet the Bible, for us, in and of itself, isn't the faith, but rather one critical tool that the church gives us to teach the faith. Put another way, scripture points to someone greater than itself. If you'd like to find a summary of what we believe, you can certainly find it in the Nicene Creed. We're not the only church to use the creed, of course, or a version of it. But for those of you who may not know, the creed was written in the year 325 in the first ecumenical council held in Nicaea. This was a council that was called by the emperor Constantine to address a heresy by a priest named Arius from Alexandria, Egypt, and some of his followers who denied Christ's divinity. Interesting at that council, St. Nicholas was there, like the St. Nicholas, jolly old St. Nick. Well, jolly old St. Nick walked up to Arius and slapped him across the face so hard he knocked him out, and they arrested St. Nicholas and, and threw him in jail for assault, which, by the way, there's a great end to that story, too, but I won't, I won't ruin it for you. But also at that council, St. Anthony the Great of Egypt, the father of monasticism, he left his cave in the Egyptian desert at the foot of Mount Sinai, traveled all the way to Nicaea just to tell Arius that he was wrong in front of everybody, and then turned around and went back to his cave in the desert where he lived for another 30 years. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I think when you're getting lectured by St. Anthony and slapped around by Santa Claus, I think it might be time for you to reevaluate your position on a few things, but you know, that's just me. So, uh, what do we do here? What's an Orthodox service like? Bless you. Um, anyway, so if you've never been to an Orthodox church before, you should come and experience it for yourselves. We welcome everybody. We'd love to have you. Um, but when you come, and I hope you do, it's probably helpful if you know a few things going in, right? I remember walking through those doors 30 years ago, and it would have been nice if my wife or my girlfriend at the time would have clued me in on a few things. So let me just share some things with you all that I think might help. And the first one is simply knowing the reason why we're here, the purpose of our services, is the communion of God and man through prayer and through the sacraments, specifically the sacrament of communion. Biblical worship from the time of Cain and Abel has always meant sharing a meal with God, and Christianity just inverts that, and God offers himself as sacrifice to us. And so we come here to pray, to glorify God, and to commune with God through prayer and the sacraments. Um, you will also notice, those of us coming from some of the Protestant confessions, that the focus is not on the sermon. Even the pulpit is ticked off to the left over there. Don't get me wrong, we love a good sermon as much as the next guy. Um, even our services are named after St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means the golden mouth, so eloquent were his sermons that the church actually saw fit to give him that title, golden mouth, Chrysostom. So we love a good sermon. It's just not the reason why we're here or the purpose of our services. You will also notice pretty quickly, in fact, this takes a little getting used to, that we Orthodox stand when we pray. We don't sit, we stand as one you know, stands before God. In fact, many Orthodox churches don't even have pews, so they forgo even an opportunity of sitting down, except for maybe a few benches along the outside for the elderly and the infirmed. There's even a meme on the internet that says, Orthodox Christianity, standing room only since 33 AD. So we will be standing for much, if not all, of the service, depending on where you are. But we stand because we participate in the liturgy, right? We're not an audience. Our prayers are joined with those of the angelic hosts, and together it becomes heaven on earth, the throne room of God. The word liturgy literally means the work of the people, not the work of the priest or the choir or the chanters, but the work of the people, right? Speaking of liturgy, our services are liturgical. And again, we are not the only church to have a liturgy. But for those of you who may not know, a liturgy is simply a standard set of prayers and praises, prayed, sung, often here in the Orthodox Church, chanted each week as one body. And you know, for the uninitiated, this might seem repetitive. I mean, it is, after all, the same liturgy each week. And yet, despite this familiarity, we don't experience boredom. And I think one of the reasons why that is, is that through that repetition, there's a rhythm to it, and through that rhythm, the mind is calmed and the thoughts are stilled. Remember, it says in the Bible, be still and know that I am God. 
the Greek word for it is is ihia. There's an inner stillness, sort of an inner quiet that we seek in prayer, especially private prayer. Corporate prayer, liturgical prayer is somewhat different. As I said, there's, there's work to be done. But in the words of St. Isaac the Syrian, if you're a lover of truth, be a lover of silence. And really, what better lessons than these can the church hand down to us here in the 21st century? Because in our busy lives today, when are we ever just still? And when is it ever silent? Now, you will also notice here in the cathedral, at least, that part of the services will be done in Greek. Not a lot, but parts. And we have books for everyone so that no one misses a single word. If you were in a Russian Orthodox Church, you'd probably hear some Russian. If you were in an Antiochian, perhaps Arabic, um, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian Orthodox Churches, probably some of those languages. But what's really amazing is, is that Sunday, we'll all be saying the same prayers. We'll read the same gospel readings, the same epistle readings. And whatever the topic of the sermon is that day, it will most likely be on the exact same topic. So whether you're standing in a church in Jerusalem or Athens, Greece, Moscow, or Atlanta, GA, it's still one church. I also think you'll find that whatever's going on in here, here in the heart, is, in, is incredibly important during prayer. Um, in fact, so, I mean, so the priests, like I said, we're not an audience and they're not putting on a show. They're not about to break into Les Mis. So what's going on in our hearts during prayer is incredibly important. And there's a wonderful story that illustrates this beautifully with the conversion of the Slavic lands. Prince Vladimir of Kiev and all of Rus wanted to attach a, a religion to his court. And so being a good leader, he sent out emissaries all around the world and said, go and find out about the world's religions, report back to us. We'll pick the best one. And they went all over. They went to Rome, they went to Germany. The, the church hadn't officially broken apart, but there were long-standing cultural differences. They went to the Muslim court. One group went to Constantinople, to their church of Hagia Sophia, the church of holy wisdom, where you could still go today. And this is what they wrote back to the prince. They said, when we stood in the temple, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For in truth, we did not know that one could behold such beauty and such magnificence on earth. We cannot possibly relate to you what we saw in that place. But the one thing we know is in that place, God dwells among men. And all the worship of other nations is to us several more as nothing. We cannot forget the beauty that we saw in that place. Whoever has seen so sweet a sight will no longer be satisfied with anything else, nor will we consent to remain in paganism any longer as we are now. Strong words to the prince, right? We won't consent? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and if anyone's seen statues of Vladimir, he doesn't look like someone to be trifled with. And yet they write back to the prince such strong language. And the reason why I share this story with you and how it relates to what goes on in our hearts during prayer is that these Slavic envoys weren't Greek speakers. They wouldn't have understood a single word that was being said. No, no catechesis whatsoever. And yet they write back to the prince, the one thing we know, we know, is God dwells there among men. St. Diodicus of Fotiki once said that true theology isn't information about God, but an experience of God. And that's what I feel when I come here and pray each week, is an experience of God. I certainly think that's what the envoys must have felt when they stood in Hagia Sophia so many years ago. So before we get to the icons, real quick, a um, couple of few things. Um, we Orthodox are Trinitarian. We believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the faith and the church are inseparable, that we live a life fully in Christ through the church where we receive the sacraments, and we believe the sacrament of communion to be the literal true blood and body of Christ. Now, I hope that gives you a sense of what Orthodox Christianity is. I guarantee you I haven't done it justice in the last 20 minutes that I've been talking. Um, you know, here's 2,000 years of Christian history, Scott, go. But. Um, if you could take away a few things, I would hope that they would be that the church is ancient and yet still timeless. It's full of wisdom and yet still humble and quiet. I also like to keep this in mind anytime I'm giving these talks. There's a British bishop in our church, Callistos, who taught for years at Oxford in England. He actually passed away a couple of weeks ago. And his, his students at Oxford were always peppering him with questions about God. And he reminded them, he said, it's not the task of Christianity to provide simple answers to every question, but rather to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God 
he said, is not so much the object of our knowledge as is the cause of our wonder. Mystery and wonder are certainly concepts that we're comfortable with here in the Orthodox Church. And so let's apply them to the iconography all around us. Icons are probably the first thing you'll notice when you came into the church, right? And they are, just like the Slavic envoy said, beautiful. But what they didn't know at the time, perhaps, is that for the Orthodox Christian, this isn't art, right? It's not an aesthetic. Art is to be viewed. Icons are to be experienced. And really, iconography should always be thought of as tools, right? Tradition is a tool that the church uses. Scripture is a tool that the church gives us. Iconography as well are tools, tools that are meant to inspire us to prayer and silent contemplation. If you'll notice, all of their mouths are closed. Even the icons are quiet. And through their silence, they express the inexpressible. You see, ours is a confession that surrounds itself with iconography in order to remind itself that the veil between this world and the next is thin and that God and the saints and the angels, they're all right here because God wants to be as close as possible to his creation that he loves. Now, you will see us cross ourselves and kiss the icons. There's a simple reason for this. Don't anybody freak out. Um, we cross ourselves so that we bodily, physically acknowledge our belief in the Holy Trinity. For us, Christianity is not just a mental exercise, but it includes the entire person, right? There's a physicality about our worship, to be sure. And we kiss the icons for the same reason why I might kiss a picture of my wife if I were on a long road trip away from her, right? I can't see her physically in front of me, but I can always pull a picture of her out of my wallet and kiss it goodnight. The same idea applies. We have a relationship with Christ, his mother, and the saints. We love them and we kiss them the same way we would a family member. Now, most, ortho, most, most icons in Orthodox churches are paint on wood or paint on canvas. We have a rare blessing in our cathedral with our mosaic icons. These icons were done by Mr. Sirio Tonelli, who was not Orthodox when he began the project, but became Orthodox by the time he finished the project. Um, he began with the six panels on the side, which are 22 feet high and 10 and a half feet wide. Then this back panel here called the Patitera Ton Oranon, which means wider or more spacious than the heavens, and is a reference to Mary's womb being capable of holding God. Um, and then the dome, all of that was completed in 1970. This, um, the, the narthex where you walked in was done in 78, and then this back panel here was a later project. And so now I'll just come through and just, if you were, as if you were talking about the icons as if you were coming through our front doors. So when you walk in the door back there, if you look up, if you missed it, go and check it out. But there's a beautiful icon of Christ giving the Sermon on the Mount. It's beautiful. I probably was coming here three years before I noticed it. I'm like, wow, look at that. Uh, just to your left as you walk in is an icon of the resurrection. And then to your right behind the candle stand over there is an icon of the Virgin Mary or Theotokos. Theotokos means the, the God bearer and is the title by which we refer to the Virgin Mary by. As you proceed toward the lit candles and the doors of the nave here, you probably notice two large icons on the walls. One is of an old man with a long, beautiful white beard. This is St. Petros of Argos, the bishop and wonder worker of Peloponnese. We have a number of families from the Peloponnese area of Greece, so he's very important to us. And then across from him is St. Catherine. She was a child martyr. If you've ever heard of a Catherine wheel, this is where that comes from. And we've placed um, placards beside each of their icons. And if you've got some time, they really are fascinating stories. So I highly recommend going and spending some time with those. Now, here within the nave, we'll start up here at the nativity icon. Here's the really cool thing about icons. They're teaching tools. For the, for the majority of, of time up until the printing press, most people were, were, uh, couldn't read, and they also didn't have Bibles to take home from the, with them. So this is one of these reasons for we, they're teaching tools. And the cool thing is that you can teach the smallest child the simplest lesson or the smartest theologian the most complex. So we'll start at the nativity icon up in the corner there. This is a bit of an amalgamation icon as it shows Christ as an infant but also as a young child. You'll also notice Joseph in the green over there. Joseph looks like he's having a bad day. 
Well, the reason for that is that most versions of this icon, Mr. Tonelli chose to leave this part out, but in most versions, Joseph is talking to an old man, and that old man is Satan, and Satan is whispering into his ear that the child is really not divine, which harkens back to the Arian heresy that I mentioned earlier, so that's why that's there. So again, simple story of Christ coming into the world, or the intricacies of the Arian heresy and Christology within that, so whichever way you want to go, there's lots there. Right. Next, we have Christ's uh, baptism in the River Jordan. This icon also bears the names Theophany and Epiphany. Theophany and Epiphany mean vision of God. And the reason why that icon bears those titles is that the participants of this event heard the voice of God the Father say, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. They saw Christ in the flesh, and then they observed the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove. And so Father, Son, Holy Spirit, vision of God, Theophany. You'll also notice the two little figures on the bottom. They represent the River Jordan and the seas. When Christ entered the river, the River Jordan actually changed directions, and it had been written in Psalm 114.3 that the seas saw and fled, the River Jordan turned back. So that's why those figures are there. Next we have the um, transfiguration icon, Christ transfigured in light on Mount Tabor. Picture you see Christ enveloped in what is called a mandorla. Mandorla is an Italian word that simply means almond, but represents the uncreated light. To his left, the prophet Elias, or Elijah, and to his right, the prophet Moses. Moses is the one holding the book of law, not the one with the long white beard. And below them, Peter, John, and James, who ascended the mountain and beheld Christ in his glory as far as they were able. Next, of course, Christ, the crucifixion icon, Christ on the cross. Below Christ, the three Marys, Mary the mother of God, the Theotokos, uh, Mary, the, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Salome. To the right, St. John the theologian and Joseph of Arimathea. Within this icon, you'll rarely see the crown of thorns. Most often we replace the crown of thorns with the halo, the crown of glory. And really you're not necessarily to see Christ suffering his passion, but rather his sacrifice. This is just after he's uttered the words, it's finished. Across from that icon is the resurrection icon, Christ's descent into Hades. Picture you see Christ trampling down the doors of Hades. You see death in chains. Christ is lifting Adam and Eve out of the tombs, and they are surrounded by the kings and prophets of old. You'll often have King David and King Solomon in this icon, and you will always, always have St. John the Baptist in this icon. Next, we have the uh, ascension into heaven. Forty days after the resurrection, Christ ascended into heaven. What's interesting in this icon is that Christ and his mother are always pictured as being very calm. But there's always a tumult around Mary because everyone was wondering, okay, well, what do we do now? What happens next? And so that's why that's that way. Of course, those questions were answered ten days later on Pentecost. Pentecost literally means 50 days. And pictured you have the 12 apostles, 12, because according to Acts chapter 2, they had replaced Judas Iscariot with Matthias. You'll also notice above each of their heads is a, is a flame. It was written in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of flame. And so above each of their head is a flame. You'll also notice a gap at the top of that icon. In most versions, it's a little wider, but that, that gap is the seat for Christ. He is the head of our church, after all, and that is the seat for Christ, and he is invisibly present within that icon. Next, we have the Dormition of the Theotokos. This is the death of the Virgin Mary. Picture you see um, Mary on her deathbed. She is surrounded by 11 of the 12 apostles because poor Thomas was late again. You'll also see Christ holding what looks like a child. That's Mary's soul. He holds her as she once held him. She is now in his arms. And then across the back there is Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. This is our Palm Sunday icon. This is the only icon that comes to us out of chronological order, but as I mentioned earlier, it's a later project. So if I could just have your attention back this way, a few more icons to go over. Uh, they're even on the, uh, the altar of the, 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 uh, the pulpit, and they represent the four gospels that are preached from the pulpit. Uh, Matthew is the angel, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John the eagle. Um, on this raised platform here, the Plati, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the Solea, a double-headed eagle that represents New Rome. Uh, the double-headed eagle looks at both the east and the west parts of the empire. On the bishop's throne is always an icon of Christ the high priest. 
And then that brings us to this wall of icons here. This is an, uh, called an iconostasis. And this is something that did develop over time. In the earliest churches, they just had a curtain around the, uh, the altar. Then they took the curtain down and put um, uh, uh, pillars around it, and then they put icons in front of the pillars, and it developed into this over time. And now all icon all iconostasis follow the same patterns, the same rules, and they are these. So in front, you always have what's called the royal doors. To the right of the royal doors is always Christ Pantocrator, ruler of all. To the left, or to Christ's right, always sits his mother. If you read through Kings, um, it, they, the Davidic kings always has, this is the king, and so-and-so was his mother. She sits at his right hand in a place of honor. So you'll always have a, an icon of, of, the, of, the, of Mary at the right hand of Christ. To the left, or to the right of Christ, is always an icon of uh, St. John the Baptist. And to the right of St. John is the door through which we enter the altar, and that always has an icon of uh, the Archangel Gabriel on it. Going back the other way, to the left of Mary is the icon for which the church is named. In this case, it's the Annunciation. So we have an Annunciation icon where the Archangel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would bear Christ. If we had, you know, if our church was the Holy Trinity, we would have a Holy Trinity icon there, or if it was, any, if it was um, something else, it would be that icon. Then to the left of that is the Archangel Michael. That's the door through which we exit the altar. And then in the back, I told you a minute ago, uh, the Platitera Ton Oranon, wider or more spacious than the heavens. Again, it's a reference to Mary's womb being capable of holding God, right? And the, the reason why she's there is that this, that wall can touch the ceiling and the floor. And Christ came down from heaven, taking flesh from Mary's womb, and became man. And so that's why we will always have a picture or an icon of Mary in a place of honor in our churches. And then finally, the dome. The dome itself is symbolic of, of God bending the heavens to hear our prayers. You see Christ Pantocrator. Within the, within the icon, you see the Greek letters ICXC. That's an abbreviation of Jesus Christ. That simply means Isu Christe. And then when, within his halo, you see the word Ohon, which means the one who is, which were the words spoken in the burning bush. And then finally, there are 3.5 million tiles the size of your little, a digit in your little finger in the dome itself. And that is our tour, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys for showing up, and thanks for coming out. I hope you all enjoyed the festival. And uh, if you all have any questions, come down and ask. We're here for you guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs>